Hey there, folks. My name is Misadventure, and welcome to the first episode of the Cascus playthrough. This is going to be a long-form Let's Play of the 2014 massively multiplayer online role-playing game, Elder Scrolls Online, featuring a couple of add-ons. Now, before we talk about the character we'll be playing as in this playthrough, Quintus Cascus, the Imperial Necromancer, I want to first talk about the add-ons I'm using, and I should note that in the description below, you can find some logistic info about the series, as well as more info about these add-ons. Now, I'm playing with three add-ons at the minute, with a fourth one that I may enable if people want to see it. That's not the right button. Here it is. So, the add-on I'm not playing with by default, and let me know in the comments if you want to see this add-on be tried out in this playthrough. It's called True Exploration. Normally in this game, maps both of dungeons and different interior areas, but also the overworld, all start off completely filled in, and you can just uh, view what's ahead of you. With True Exploration turned on, all of them would be shrouded by fog, and we'd have to actually discover all the different nooks and crannies for it to fill in on the map. Definitely a cool idea, but I don't like how this add-on always applies to every map, including the overland zone maps, which I don't think should be affected by it. But I can't tweak it uh, in the game without it just being on or off. So I'm gonna play with it off for now, but again, let me know in the comments if you wanna see this be tried out and I will give it a go. Now, speaking of maps, I have a couple other map-related add-ons. I've got Votin's Minimap, which is my favorite minimap add-on for this game. There's no minimap in ESO by default, but this one adds one in. It actually uses the same coding and UI of the actual in-game world map, so it's all very seamless. This is a very simple, very kind of no-fuss, very sort of simplistic map add-on that does the job perfectly, and I don't need anything more complicated than that, so we're going to go with Votin's minimap for this playthrough. Lastly, one of my favorite add-ons of all time for ESO is called the Accurate World Map. It's a bit hard to explain what this does if you don't know how the ESO world map normally looks, but you can find some side-by-side -side pictures online for sure. Basically, what this mod does is it slightly redraws, particularly the, the sort of continent map and other sort of very far zoomed out maps to be more accurate to the shape and the scaling that's in the lore as opposed to the slightly wonky scaling that was in the game originally, also redraws the borders of the zones on the map to be more accurate. And additionally, I've set in the uh, the settings for this uh, add-on to also change the names of some of the zones in my UI to be more accurate or more lore appropriate as well. So uh, because I may reference the accurate world map version names of some of these zones, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll try to also mention the default name, but you should be able to figure out with context clues where I am. <laughs> let me know in the comments if you ever get confused about where I am, and I'll try my best to answer that and let you know what the regular ESO version of the name happens to be. Don't think that's going to be too big of a problem, though. Lastly, I'm playing with NTAC Dialogue. This is a dialogue add-on, or obviously, I should really say this is a conversation add-on for talking with NPCs. The main thing I'm doing with this add-on is changing how the camera works so that when I talk to an NPC, instead of them being on the left of the screen and all the dialogue being squished onto the right, they're gonna be in the center of the screen with the camera centering on them, and then the dialogue will be neatly displayed below them with a bit more um, just kind of neatness to everything. Some of the uh, NPC dialogue camera angles will be a bit weird because this is not the way the game was originally designed, but this overwhelmingly works with most NPCs. So the occasional wonky camera angle from a dialogue shouldn't destroy the gaming experience, hopefully. Let me know in the comments of what you think ultimately about how this changes things up, but I'm pretty excited about this. Right, so let's also talk for a quick sec about Quintus Cascus. So he is an Imperial Necromancer. I've made the decision not to start this video with any sort of long overview of his backstory. I do have a backstory in mind for him, but I want that to be kind of revealed as we play as many of the early quest lines will actually give me a great chance to kind of allude to his backstory. What I will say for now, just as some basic info, is that he is 30 years old. He is an Imperial Necromancer, in the sense of Imperial is his race, uh, and I actually had to go in the game as a temporary Breton character to actually buy the Imperial race, because it's an unlockable, or I should really say it's a purchasable, playable race um, that can be in any of the factions. I've just joined the Daggerfall Covenant for what I'll explain later are story reasons, but as a character, he's not specifically like 100% completely a Daggerfall character. I'll talk about that more later on when it becomes relevant. But he is an Imperial and he's a Necromancer. Now, 
I will say really quick that Necromancer is a pretty interesting class in this game. If you don't know, many Necromancer abilities are actually criminal acts, sort of like stealing. And if you use them in front of uh, like townspeople and guards, you'll actually get a fine and be arrested. So we have to be pretty careful with our Necromantic powers. As we'll see as Cascus' uh, story sort of begins here, he's not exactly a super evil character, even though necromancers are presumably usually evil. He is more of a reluctant necromancer, and we'll explain or sort of explore how that is for a character like this, but I'm hoping to have a pretty interesting time with what I hope is a pretty unique character idea here, but we'll get into that more later on. And of course, as an Imperial, we'll talk about his uh, racial abilities and special bonuses for that. The Imperial race, in my opinion, isn't necessarily super overpowered, but I do like their bonuses for what I want to go for in this playthrough. And I will say as well, this is going to be, to the best of my ability, a complete 100% playthrough of Elder Scrolls Online. I'm planning to play through all three factional storylines, so that's 15 full zones and a bunch of other side zones as well. Um, all the content from the base game, and then I'll play through all of the expansions in sort of their release order so that the stories all make sense. I'll try my best to follow the various online spreadsheets uh, and sort of flowcharts of how to progress through this game in the correct order, as many of the expansions build on each other, and it's important not to accidentally play the wrong expansion in the wrong order. But at the same time, the ZeniMax, the developers of this game, really did design the post-launch content to be playable in kind of any order so as a lore and story nerd i'm going to focus on trying to follow the release order just to avoid any chance of any spoilers uh, even a small thing but technically if you're playing this game on your own you can play basically any content you like i'm going to play this essentially in release order which means among other things the writing may improve as we progress although some parts of this game's history do have better writing I'm going to talk a lot throughout this playthrough about my mostly positive feelings about this game's storytelling and writing and other matters like that. But all that being said, let's go ahead and jump in to the Cascus playthrough. And I should note that I have already gone in, into, I was about to say I've already gone into him, but that would be a strange thing to say. I've already uh, played as him for about an hour, not doing anything, just standing in the spot that I spawn into tweaking all of my add-ons to be set up correctly, so this isn't the first time I've entered the game as this character, but I haven't done anything in the game yet aside from just UI setup. So everything should be good to go to begin this playthrough without an hour of UI setup that you'd have to sit through. I've done that all off camera. So let's go ahead and begin the uh, the playthrough here as Quintus Cascus, the level one Imperial Necromancer. Let's see if I log in correctly, or log in successfully. Sometimes it glitches out. That'd be a funny way to start things off. We're in the Isle of Balfiera, which uh, we're going to learn in a minute exactly what we're doing here. Oh, wake. Oh, thank the stars. So here we are in Elder Scrolls Online. By the way, if you are an Elder Scrolls uh, franchise veteran, you may notice that this looks very similar to Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. And in many ways, that I'll talk about a lot throughout this entire playthrough, this game feels very much like a next-generation Oblivion MMO more than a Skyrim MMO. And I say that in the most positive way. I think this game does a very good job rehabilitating um, the unique character of Oblivion that, for me and many other people who initially came to this franchise through Skyrim, kind of overlooked and kind of waved off Oblivion as not really being as good. And I've really changed my mind. I now view Oblivion and Skyrim as both very strong in their own ways. And this game helped me appreciate Oblivion's sort of sense of humor and character a lot more. But this game definitely has a lot of its own merit beyond just being similar to a good game like Oblivion. Again, I'll talk about this game's writing and storytelling and other sort of parts to it a lot as we progress. But whatever the case, here we are um, playing as Quintus Cascus the Imperial. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh, I could spend a long time talking about, well, that's not the right button, talking about the user interface, but for now what I'll say, for level one, we are playing as a necromancer, the necromancer class, we'll talk about these abilities later on when we get to them, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through everything right here, I will quickly read our opening quest, the Gates of Adamant, I awoke imprisoned in a strange ruin, an elf seems willing to help me, but escaping this place may not be easy, danger lurks around every corner, and I sense that some darkness arrived with me. I spied an elf on the other side of my cell door. I should speak with her. Talk to Norianway. So, uh, without getting too bogged down in all of the various tabs I could show you right now, 
let's just start the tutorial and this whole video will just be the tutorial I think as there's even within just the tutorial a lot going on and let's begin our adventure here in second era Tamriel as Quintus Cascus although first I will note I'm gonna quickly go ahead and grab my daily reward which I wanted to wait to do on camera as every I'm gonna try my best to play sessions uh, as frequently as I can I can't necessarily play this every day I may grab the daily rewards off camera just so I'm not missing out on them, even if I don't record a full session. So uh, we can start, because uh, it's uh, December 1st when I'm recording this, we can grab the first item of December, the, gr the Grand Gold Coast Experience Scroll. Um, I'll talk more about what that means and how I'll use that in the future, but for now I'm just going to go ahead and mark that as junk, and uh, don't worry about it. We'll come back to that later, <laughs> which I'll be saying a lot. Also, I should note that um, there is one part of my user interface that my camera is covering up, which is the items received pop up in the bottom right there's no way for me to move it without more mods and i didn't want to get too bogged down with ui overhaul mods which often are pretty hard to work with the like map mods that i'm using so at the minute i'm okay compromising that and just having you folks not be able to see items that i pick up or receive in in what you're seeing because my camera covers that up but if um that ends up being a big problem for whatever reason i'll just say what items i get uh if it matters. I'm going to pick up a lot of random items that you won't need to care about, but um, I may end up moving the camera if I can find another spot for it. There's not really a lot of great spots, because as an MMORPG, once I get to, you know, later on especially, we're going to have a screen covered in UI elements of all sorts of things. So for now, though, let's go ahead and talk to this elf, Norianwe, and see what she has to say about how we ended up in this mysterious prison cell, which, of course, is a very Elder Scrolls-style opening scenario to be in. There you are. On your feet. I know magical translocation can really upset the stomach. Just take a moment and get your bearings, all right? Where am I? The Isle of Balfiera, home of Clan Barini. I apologize for the cramped accommodations. We pride ourselves on courtesy, but circumstances here have taken a turn for the bazaar. I needed to make sure you weren't a danger to yourself or others. Can you let me out? You might not be so eager to escape once you hear what's going on. You arrive via a portal, along with a daedric beast called Shiazel. It seized control of our golems and unleashed them on the island. If I free you, will you help me stop Shiazel? Yes, set me free and I'll help. Master nice of Diplomacy Just already. There, Speech 100, that as they should say. Unlock the door. Yeah, you by the way, ready. the... The Elder Scrolls and Skyrim meme references will be an ongoing and unavoidable part of this playthrough, so just brace yourselves for that one. Before we go and talk with Norianwe in a tradition that will become uh, ever-present in this playthrough, I'm going to first loot everything in sight. Now, I have a, a uh, ESO Plus membership, so I'm paying um, a, a monthly membership for some extra in-game bonuses. Uh, the best one of which is that I have the Craft Bag. This is by far... Uh, the most important part of ESO Plus. I'm also, by the way, getting a... What you see on the screen for my buffs is a, a buff which improves my... What, what's relevant here is experience, gold, and inspiration. Archival Fortunes is an expansion feature I'll talk about in, like, five years whenever I get to the Necrom expansion. And Trait Research Speed will explain later when I get to crafting. But I do have uh, these experience, gold, and inspiration bonuses. I would say that in terms of the <clears throat> the fairness of having an ESO Plus membership, I would first of all say that this game basically is incomplete without that membership. You can play it, you have to buy the game, you can play it without any sort of monthly cost, but you miss out on most of the content because all the expansions are locked off unless you buy them, um, and all the uh, sort of side uh, DLC zones are locked off as well. It's honestly worth it if you want to play this game to just buy the membership and play with it. And uh, this bonus here doesn't directly improve combat or anything. It's just, you know, XP, gold, and, and inspiration, which is for crafting. But the most important thing is that craft bag, because basically all crafting materials go there automatically, and it's an infinite amount of room. And without that, you're going to be playing inventory micromanagement for most of the time if you're not using the ESO Plus uh, craft bag. So I definitely think that this game is very much designed with you to, to have ESO Plus for it to, to sort of... Uh, play the best, and that's what I will be doing in this playthrough. So, let's go ahead and start searching around, and I guess without, um, because I have auto loot on, it's just going to pop up. we got some clear water. Um, 
Let me see. Actually, you know one thing I could do? This is a bit, this might be a bit painful, but just for your benefit, I'm actually going to turn off auto loot so that you can see in the middle of the screen what I'm picking up, because otherwise you're not going to see at all what I'm picking up. I'm not going to want to save it every single time. So let me find in this uh, giant in, giant set of options what I'm trying to change here. It's down here. Yeah, here it is. Auto loot off. Okay. So now in the screen, you can see, you know, clear water. I'll grab that. And you don't see the pop-up in the bottom right, but I picked it up. I'll say if I don't pick something up, uh, or like, you'll eventually figure out what I'm not going to pick up. Um, I'm just picking up uh, crafting resources and things I can sell. Merchant items, basically. I'm not going to pick up any weapons. Okay, this I'm... Oh, that's a pretty good find. Level 1 pewter ring. Grab that. Give me just a second. We're on the way. I'm looting your, your room here. And that is not euphemism. That is a literal description of what's happening right now. Just a quick sec. So this is, um, brace yourself for a lot of this. This is a large part of uh, playing this game for me. I am a compulsive looter, and I will be looking for loot in every nook and cranny. Uh, I'm just going to do a circuit of the room. And this is going to come back to help us in a big way when we're trying to do crafting. We're going to have so much random junk sitting around in the craft bag, ready for us to make use of for crafting purposes without having to go look for stuff or worse, buy stuff off the player auction houses, or, and, uh, or not auction houses, sorry, uh, the player uh, guild traders. Right, we got ourselves our first uh, craft recipe. This is for provisioning, which is basically this game's version of cooking. We'll take a look at that later. I don't want to get involved in that right now. Also, I love this uh, little Dark Souls reference. There's just a, uh, a knight sitting by the fire. That's quite scenic. A little stuff like that scattered around. All right, lots of lockpicks, by the way. We're gonna have essentially infinite lockpicks if I just uh, continue looting, you know, as I go. No uh, no daggers yet, which I was kind of hoping to see so I could show you one thing I will do. I'm gonna largely not pick up uh, weapons or armor that are unenchanted and are only of common quality because they're not worth anything and they take up regular inventory slots, not craft bag slots because they're not a crafting item. But like these uh, sell to merchant items that have like one gold value are still worth having in your inventory because they stack on each other. So hopefully that makes sense. I think I, I found everything here. And for what it's worth, help go hop in the middle here. This uh, destroyed little way shrine area. Hop back out. Yeah, the jumping in this game is a little goofy, so just uh, don't mind that. I don't know, I'm jumping backwards now. The, yeah, not the best jumping. And this game's animation and graphics are a little wonky sometimes, but this game makes up for uh, questionable quality of graphics with quantity, as there is an enormous world ahead of us. Incidentally, let me actually just go ahead and show you how big the world is. So, ignore where I'm going to appear on the main map, because this is glitched as I'm in the tutorial area and I'm looking at a modded map, but this is the world, um, and I guess I can't easily show you the level of scale here, because I'm not in any main zone. But basically, each of these is an entire zone, which would I would say be... Uh, five to twenty hours of of questing at the level I'll be doing in terms of uh, the sort of like doing every quest, listening to all the NPCs, doing all the uh, the side objectives. So multiple sessions per zone, and this is the game. Just kidding. There's even more. <laughs> so this is Tamriel, the continent. But then there's also different realms you can go to in the end game. These are all again different zones. Some of these include multiple different areas. There's just so much going on, and again, this game is almost 10 years old. There's been new zones and new dungeons. All these uh, sort of black icons are all uh, high-level dungeons. And what's not displayed here are all of the lower-level dungeons. There's at least one per zone. And there's a couple of these way shrines. I'll explain later why those are appearing right now. But within every single zone, there's at least uh, three sort of main hub areas, different cities, uh, for example... Got Daggerfall, Aldcroft, and Crosswitch in the first main zone we're going to be going to, which is Glenembra. Um, we also have smaller zones. It's just there's a lot of content in this game, so we're going to be doing this playthrough for a very long time. The most recent zone, by the way, added is what in this mod is called the Indural Highlands. In the base game, without this add-on, it's called the Telvani Peninsula. So we're not going to get here for a very long time because this will be the last one on the list. I'm going to play through all this game's content in release order, starting with the three main uh, sort of campaigns of the three factions. There's also PvP in this game and an entire massive PvP zone called Cyrodiil. This is the setting of Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, by the way, and it's nearly a one-to-one -one recreation, if not a larger scale, than the Oblivion version of the same territory. So, by the way, like, each of these areas, like... Uh, 
that's a good example. Um, like this is a full size city. Like those are large buildings here, and th there's the imperial city. So it's it's larger than the Oblivion version. So this just goes to show how ridiculous the scale of this world is. It floors me every day. Vardenfell, like this entire area here, this is the entire setting of Morrowind the game. Elder Scrolls Three Morrowind. This is a larger scale or a similar scale. Actually, I think it's a. It might be a little bit smaller, but it's a, it's a similar scale to. Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, and it's just one-tenth of the size of this world. This is an enormous game, and there's so much ahead of us here. I'm so excited for this adventure. But first, let's talk to this elf who's helped us out, Norianway, and see what she has to say about uh, what's going on here. There you are. Free as a spring cricket. I hope you intend to keep your word. We'll need each other out there. Of that, I'm certain. The name's Norianway, by the way, of Clan Dorini. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Where are we headed? We're bound for a place called the Keyrite's Gallery. But first, I need to know you can defend yourself. Hurtling through the Orbis and falling flat on your ear left you a bit scattered. Find a weapon, and we'll work out the cobwebs. Fair. Sure, but I have some questions. Of course. I can't promise total transparency, but I'll be as forthcoming as I can. What are you doing here? Nothing irresponsible, if that's what you're asking. I'm a member of Clan Dorini's Intelligence Guild, the Cinderer. More scholar than spy, I assure you. I was conducting some research in the gallery, then pop! You and that monster arrived. Why were you studying this place? The gallery's always been a place of special interest for the Guild, but we never quite cracked how it worked. Despite the dangers, this is our greatest breakthrough to date. The Guild Master will be ecstatic. Provided we get it under control. You mentioned a Keyrite's Gallery. What is that place? The Keyrite's Gallery is an ancient substructure of Balfiera Island, built long before my clan arrived. Why is it called the Keyrite's Gallery? On account of all the doors. The gallery's full of <coughs> ancient gates, each with some arcane connection to places in Tamriel and beyond. Once the gates came to life, rifts opened. You fell out of one of them, the Daedra. Shy as El emerged from another. How did you escape? I cast an incantation of the steed, snatched you up, and fled as fast as my feet would carry me. I heard the Daedra cursing, followed by some kind of explosion, but I didn't look back. I hope the gallery is still standing. You said something about golems. What's going on here exactly? Would it frustrate you to hear that I have no idea? We Dereni are cautious by nature, so the Isle of Bolfiera has many defenses. Magical stone guardians protect many of our sacred sites, but somehow this Daedra found a way to turn them against us. Can you describe the Daedra, Shiazel? Ugh, do I have to? If I recall my studies correctly, I'd say it's a harvester. A huge serpentine creature that feeds on souls and magicka. If it finds a way to consume the energies of the gallery, we will be in very serious trouble. All right. So, um, if you don't know what anything she just said means, don't worry, you're not supposed to. This is uh, not going to be super lore relevant forever. A lot of the, um, the sort of scenarios in this game feel very much written to appeal to hardcore Elder Scrolls lore nerds like myself. Like, I know what Clay to Rennie is, and I know kind of like what she's talking about, but the average Elder Scrolls enjoyer who doesn't really get, get into the out-of-game lore wouldn't have any idea what, what they're talking about. But that's okay, because this game does a really good job with its storytelling, hinting at the really cool lore ideas without forcing you to know everything to understand what's going on. So we're in this weird ruin, there's elves here, there's a demon here that we have to help them stop, and that's kind of like the premise of the tutorial. And then we're going to learn a bit later on how this relates to the rest of the game. So first things first, we have to get ourselves a starting item. This is going to introduce us to the idea of weapon skill lines, which is the core part of this game's combat system. And for reasons that I'll explain later, I'm going to go for not really like an optimal gameplay setup, but more for a roleplay setup for right now, as I will be playing as a medium armor stamina character, uh, which if you know about ESO gameplay, you'll understand what I'm talking about there. But I'm going to go for the sword and shield first, uh, just so that I can level Sword and Shield while leveling uh, with easy low-level content. And then I'll switch over to what will be my mainstay, stamina, weapon types, two-handed, uh, and dual-wield later on. 
So, Sword and Shield is the tanking weapon skill line. It's not really meant to be used uh, otherwise, but as a solo player for presumably the majority of this playthrough, uh, having a tankier weapon setup isn't a bad idea, but I will be going for medium armor uh, right away. Um, I may eventually also want to level up heavy and light armor. I guess I could I could wear heavy armor right away too. I suppose I may as well wear that alongside Sword Shield. I'll, I'll level up all the armor types eventually, but for now, Let's uh, worry about the armor later. We'll grab a sword and shield. So we got the Ald Mary Exiles shield. The ravages of time may have tarnished this Aegis, but it remains strong enough to deflect a golem's blows. Well, that's quite convenient, given what we're about to be dealing with here. And the Ald Mary Exiles sword. A peerless example of elven smithing, dulled by age and disuse. With the right technique, it can still deal out ample punishment. All right, Larger so we're gonna... weapons like staves and great axes will yeah. take both hands to use. You can pair smaller weapons with a shield, or another weapon of that size. The choice is yours. All right. Throw these uh, borrowed yes, weapons right on. Yes, I think that one suits you. If you change your mind, feel free to take yeah, any other weapon look at that. on. Now, let's find a spot to practice. All right. So you may have noticed, by the way, I said earlier that I'm a necromancer and I'm putting on armor and weapons. This game is very much playable, and probably it's recommended to play it with all sort of pre-existing like, limited sort of class fantasy ideas of, oh, like, wizards and necromancers have to be in robes, and, and like, you know, barbarians have to be wielding weapons and not have magic. Like, this is an Elder Scrolls game in the sense that you can mix and match everything. And the kind of necromancer I plan to play as Cascus in terms of gameplay is more like a death knight than kind of a spellcaster. However, I will eventually also level up magic weapon types like the um, elemental and healing staves, just so that I eventually am leveling all of my options for late game play. But for, you know, questing content, you really don't have to be optimal. This game, in all honesty, is a little on the easy side, and I'm not playing it to have a super hardcore difficult experience. This is more to showcase what I think is a very underrated storytelling and writing experience and, and sort of uh, lore experience for an Elder Scrolls fan. But the overland questing that will be the vast majority of this playthrough won't be super difficult. I will try my best to make it harder and having these sort of weird suboptimal builds from the start, focusing more on leveling everything, will help with that to be sure. So for now, we've got the sword and shield. One reason I can't show you this right now because I can't see my imperial passives quite yet until I think level 5. Imperials by default actually get a bonus to the speed that they level sword and shield, so I figure I may as well start with that just to get this level up to 50, which is the max for any skill line, and then switch to, oh, here's a good example. I'm not gonna pick up this dagger because it's only, uh, it's unenchanted and it's only common uh, rarity, so there's no reason to spend one of my uh, few, or use one of my few inventory slots to, to hold that dagger for now. Uh, they're, they're, don't need to worry about that. And it's not gonna be worth uh, replacing my current weapon with. I will often switch out my equipment as a find equipment on corpses and whatnot, but stuff you pick up from containers or from the world are generally common value and not super good, so we'll see if I end up switching stuff around more before I get to a certain area in the tutorial that does have a lot of cool armor options for me. We're gonna get an achievement, by the way, the first one of the, uh, the playthrough for picking up this decorative wax, so just uh, prepare for that. There we go. Wax Harvester. That's what they uh, have awarded me with for picking that up. So, by the way, um, on top of the game world being huge, as a completionist myself, and if you're a completionist, you're going to love this one, the achievement list is enormous. So, it doesn't say, I don't think, the number of achievements anywhere, but it does say the point number. There's 61,000 achievement points available, and we've just earned 10 from... Well, we've earned five from this one, and then five from this one. We earned this, by the way, because I, I think I said this earlier, maybe I didn't. In order to play as an Imperial, I had to actually buy the Imperial race as a playable race. So I had to actually go into game as a Breton really quick, buy the Imperial pack, then delete, leave the game, delete that character, and then make the, uh, this character having bought that. So I actually, er I know the Breton style of armor crafting, even though he's never learned it, because uh, whenever you play as a character of any race, all your other characters know those races' styles by default. It's just kind of a, a fun detail. So I happen to have the racial style of the Bretons unlocked already, and then I've got the uh, decorative uh, wax uh, discovered there. So there's also like a bajillion categories. These are all different DLCs and dungeons and whatnot. There's like so, there's so much in this game. It's enormous. It's just truly enormous. All right, so let's continue searching and looting. 
Hopefully I'm not overwhelming every... Oh, I did not mean to pick those up. Although, actually, I will use these. I'm going to wear heavy armor first, I suppose. I may as well just go for uh, leveling heavy armor as I do my, my early questing. These are Red Guard style. The style doesn't really matter too much, but we got our first bit of heavy armor. Once we get three uh, different heavy armor... Oh, that's light, so I'm not going to pick that up. Once I get three different uh, slots filled with heavy armor, we'll unlock the heavy armor skill line, and then we can go from there. But I may as well uh, level heavy armor first, because uh, I'm probably going to use it the least later on. As I don't need to be super defensible, uh, especially once I got most of my whoops, most of my abilities um, more in the later on as I level up. And the level cap in this game is 50, with a big asterisk that you can continue leveling champion points uh, as a sort of a second leveling system up to the low thousands. I don't remember what it is now, but it's very high. And there's basically like, you level to 50, but usually by the time you finish your sort of fifth zone or so, and then there's, you know, thousands more points of champion points to get. Um, so the the progression does not stop at level 50. It basically begins at level 50. But level 50 is the last time you earn experience for traditional level ups. So this is definitely a game that is end game oriented um, with most of the game sort of happening in the end game in a way. It's, again, it's kind of a weird thing to explain. I'm just going to loot over here as well. You may as well. Sash. I should have, did I come here before? This is where I came from. Never mind. All right, let's go ahead and interact with the golem. This is as good a place as any. Now, prepare yourself. Here we go. And I conjure up a dance. A little bit of a combat training. I know how to do combat. I've been playing this game for uh, almost ten years, but quickly now. So let's do some light attacks. Impressive. Well done. Now fast. Top mark. This is the speed of a one-handed weapon again, attack brilliant. in this context now with the shield. Ten. Not exactly the most offensive setup, but Ready can block. Quick. With a shield, uh, we block done. much better than without a shield, That's for obvious array. reasons. Well done. So shields Your are great for blocking, Use your heaviest attack. Ross, and then heavy attacks are another option we have. Keep up the defense. Strike hard now. Now some right. foes will try to restrain you. Quickly, break free. Ha! Break You're free. unstoppable. Break free just costs a lot Again, of stamina to do, so you we can't. We have to be careful to not overuse this too much. But this breaks us out of stun effects uh, with the a stamina warrior. cost. I thought you'd be. Next, we're gonna do. Um, what's next? In here. Now, again, right. now and press your advantage punish with heavy attack. We can interrupt sword. people that are casting a spell Quickly or forgetting now. an ability interrupt like it. that, and then follow up with a heavy what attack to get again. a stun on them. Or sometimes off again, balance. I think it, I don't remember what it does normally, but I think when it's a stun enemy normally. Prepares an attack, strike. Interrupting their attack will set them off balance. Good. Now we just now finish destroy. this guy off, and then we're gonna get a hit level two from this, uh, and also get uh, level two of um, one-handed shield, if I remember correctly. Let's see what we get. Actually, we may just gain the skill line. I don't know if we can get level two for that, but let's go ahead and grab our level two rewards once our things stop updating. Okay, I, I, I knew it. <laughs> so, um, let's go ahead and uh, oh, actually level three one-handed shield. Okay, that's more than I was expecting. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and claim level two rewards. For this level up, we just gain one attribute point and one skill point, and that's what we get by default. Some level ups like five and 10 and sort of special numbers like that give us more extra stuff, but this is good for now. So, uh, my plan at the minute is probably just to focus on leveling stamina. Do I want to level health while I'm playing with heavy armor? I suppose that would make more sense. It may as well. I mean, for the early levels, it may be a little harder, even though the game does try to scale enemy difficulty as you level up, because I'm not going to have my full toolkit. And Necromancer has a pretty weird toolkit with what you can get right away. So, I suppose for now I'll level health. You can always redistribute your attributes by paying gold at a shrine or by using a purchasable scroll which from with real money, but I'll use uh, the shrine option, obviously. So let's go ahead and just level health for now. We can always redistribute these later. I'll probably eventually have a stamina necromancer, again, sort of a death knight thing, but for now, we'll go with health. Um, just again, don't look at this as any sort of build guide. This is very much like for showcase purposes, not because this is like the optimal level two build or whatever. So we'll go with health for now. Yep. And then we have ourselves our first skill point. Now, I could grab any one of these three Necromancer skill line starting abilities. First, I'm going to grab actually the one hand and shield ability. I'm not actually going to wait to grab any of these until I can grab all three of them simultaneously, as I want to level all three of my Necromancer uh, sort of skill lines simultaneously and without any difference. So I'll explain more about that later once we finish the tutorial, because that's when I'll probably get access to these. You may not see any Necromancer abilities throughout this entire tutorial. 
as I want to wait to get them all until I can get them all at the same time. So for now, though, I will grab the one-handed shield uh, ability Puncture. Thrust your weapon with discipline precision at an, at an enemy, dealing 2,054 physical damage and taunting them to attack you for 15 seconds. So one-handed shield is very much a tanking sort of a line of abilities, sort of a tanking skill line. And this is the bread and butter, like, melee tanking skill uh, with any tank that's using one hand shield, which most tanks should be doing. You can also use Frost Dave, we'll talk about that in the future, but Puncture is a great starting point for any tank, and for our purposes, in solo play, everyone's going to attack me anyway, so the taunting isn't as big of a deal. But this is a solid, uh, cheap stamina ability to do some extra damage. Also, this is important, it inflicts major breach on the enemy, reducing their physical and spell resistance by nearly 6k for 15 seconds and it has a 7 meter range, which is melee range. So if you're thinking 7 meters is a long distance to hit somebody with a melee attack, you're correct. This game solves the issue, or tries to solve the issue of latency by having melee abilities have a kind of absurd 7 meter range. Ranged abilities have a 28 meter range normally, so this is a game full of long range activity. You can be quite a ways away from someone and melee attack them, or use a melee attack ability like Puncture. So. Also, don't, don't worry about these numbers down here. This is my mouse uh, with the uh, the side buttons I have it set up. So this is actually just the mouse button that I like for that. So that's fine. We got some light stuff here, but uh, even though I wouldn't normally wear light armor right now, this does sell for 10, so I'm gonna go and grab this. I'm, I'm probably gonna actually deconstruct that more than sell it. I forgot to read that, didn't I? Whoops, let me take a look at this. Forgotten Adventures Leggings. When introducing oneself to high elven royalty, it is considered proper to wear pants. Not a bad, not a bad bit of advice. Very good. So this uh, is some light legs, which are level two. They have a magicka enchantment, and they have a side modifier of training. So if I was playing with light armor, this would be a solid thing to put on. But I'm not playing with light armor, so not right now, at least. Let's see what Nargonwe has to say about my combat prowess. With moves like that, the Daedra doesn't stand a chance. Yeah. Yes, I'd say we're ready to set out. Where are we headed now? To reach the key rides gallery, we have to make it out of this ruin and across a wide field full of the golems I mentioned. With any luck, we'll be able to slip past them. But I'm not all that lucky, so I'm sorry in advance. All right, we'll head there next. What can we expect to encounter in the gallery? Well, it begins with the door, the first of many. The only way to access the gallery is through a mysterious <coughs> gateway. Once we pass through that initial door, we'll step into a huge vault. This is the part that worries me most. Why does it worry you? I believe Shiazel, the Daedric creature that's causing all this mischief, may have nested itself in there. So be prepared to fight. Will dealing with Shiazel pacify the golems? I can't say anything with certainty, but ridding the world of an otherworldly abomination can't hurt, right? Its influence might linger for a time, but the golems should return to normal before too long. Hopefully. Let's go. All right. Well, I will say about Cascus's background is that he has some experience using uh, swords and shields, and uh, he's quite comfortable uh, hefting around these... Uh... Oh, hello, another player. All right, so this is our first encounter with... Uh... Oh, goodbye. Oh, all right. <laughs> our first encounter with uh, some multiplayer action. This is an online game, so if you happen to be playing when I'm playing and you come across me, uh, be sure to say hello. If you can do a bit of uh, RP appropriate interactions with Cascus, that'd be neat, but uh, I will have to do some painful editing to cut out any bad behavior, so don't make me crack open Premiere and waste a bunch of time cutting out people saying slurs on my screen or whatever. Please don't do that. I'm going to be annoyed if you do that. Um, but um, if you do want to, afford it's worth, actually. If you want to befriend me in ESO, I'll show you. Um, I'm just at Misadventure. That's easy to remember. I did. I, I put a lot of work in to manage to get this account set up with that name. So definitely uh, send me a friend request if you want to run into me. You'll see when I'm online because I'm not streaming these. I'm just doing this off off uh, off off stream. But if you want to see when I'm online doing a recording session, you're welcome to come find me and interact with me or join me for some uh, delve quests or whatnot. But I'm probably going to mostly do the overworld questing solo as I don't want to hold up anybody by staying to listen to all the dialogue, which most people, except for me, 
would just skip through, but I am a weirdo who likes this game storytelling a lot and wants to listen to all the dialogue, even if I'm not doing a, a series like this. Um, but uh, if any of you are playing this game, there. Let me go into sneak mode. If you're playing this game, uh, I may, and you end up becoming my, my friend in ESO, I may hit you up to do dungeon content, because I want to complete the dungeons uh, in their proper time. So I will say, by the way, with heavy armor, we're not going to have a lot of uh, luck sneaking around normally, so we will have to be careful about that. But I think it's good to go ahead and uh, improve heavy armor first uh, of the three options. Alright, let's go ahead. That was a, that was a quick unsheathing. Look at that. Let's go ahead and fight this golem. We should be able to get the drop on it. Him? Her? I guess it's, it's made of stone, so gender identity is not that important for a statue, uh, probably. Whatever the case, let's go ahead and attack it, and we should be able to sort of uh, slice it down from a sneak attack and then some quick combat after, so in we go. We'll get one hit off. Nope, we're going to interrupt it. I got one hit off, but it didn't do too much damage. In this game, especially early on, you're going to have much more health than what any enemy can realistically uh, endanger you with, unless you're very, very bad at, at combat and don't know what you're doing. Which is fine, you know, people haven't played a game like this before. So, nothing wrong with having to learn this game, but I'm a very experienced ESO player, so I'm not going to hopefully... If I die at all within the first 50 levels, any time that I'm not leveling up champion points, uh, I will live with the shame, because that shouldn't really be possible <laughs> if I'm paying attention. So let's do some lockpicking to access the armory, which is a little side area that you don't have to go to. But there's some really good stuff in here, so we do want to go ahead and check this out. Let's do just some lockpicking. This, if you uh, don't... If you're paying attention, this is a very similar to the Oblivion-style lockpicking, not the Skyrim kind. So definitely a nice uh, callback there. All right. Also, entering this area, or doing the lockpick, uh, gave us some XP to increase Puncture to rank 2. The way ranking works, if you don't know, is that every skill ranks up uh, 4 times, and then once it hits sort of level 5 of rank 4, so it, it finishes ranking through rank 4, then you can morph it, and every skill has two possible morphs. And each morph gives you a new way of approaching the skill. Actually, I'm gonna... Yeah, I'm just gonna replace everything with the elf stuff in just a second here, but... Um, Many skills have morphs that change how the skill works or give you a stronger version of it. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of, uh, there's a, in the same way that everything in this game is of such high quantity, there's a lot of quantity in the different build designs. Because uh, in this game, all skill lines are separate from, like, strict class identity. Each class has three skill lines. As, a, oops, as I showed you before, as the Necromancer, I've got the Grave Lord, Bone Tyrant, and Living Death skill lines. But most skill lines in the game aren't class-based, and anyone can use any skill line that's not a class skill line. So, hence, I can play a Necromancer with a Sword and Shield, and I can play as a big, tanky Death Knight, and that's not going to be a problem in this game. Which is, I think, pretty cool. One of the best parts about this game is the, the way it approaches sort of class building. Definitely, by far, the most interesting gameplay part of the, um, the player progression and the character progression in this game. Alright, continue looting... I know this is a bit boring, but uh, future me will thank current me for doing this, as there's a lot of just random crap I'll pick up that I'll use later for crafting. So that's pretty good. Let's just continue circling around. The good stuff's in the middle, but I'm going to get to that last. Because you're looking for just random stuff to grab. You never know when you're going to be one gold shy of an important purchase and you wish you grabbed that one gold earlier. Or that one gold, the thing that was worth one gold earlier. Pick up level two shield as well to replace our current shield with in just a bit. Also pick up a level two sword. I'm not going to pick up all the armor because it's going to be uh, common and non-enchanted, but I will pick up the heavy armor, which I will be equipping. So let's go ahead and grab the helmet, gauntlets, pauldrons, where's the, here it is, girdle, sabaton's greaves, and quite, uh, curious. Check these things here. Okay, I looked at all these already, and then we go to the other side now. Peter necklace. I always pick up all jewelry because jewelry crafting is very hard to level, so it actually is worth my time to carry around a giant bag of of like low quality jewelry just to uh, deconstruct it and get a little bit of jewelry crafting experience. So that's going to be a recurring uh, feature of this uh, playthrough, especially early on. Once we get to the Somerset expansion, we get much easier access to leveling jewelry crafting. 
I'll decide actually later if I want to go there early to unlock Jewelry Ritz. So I'll talk more in the future about what I mean by that. But let's go ahead and get our guy decked out in proper Elven gear. So let's replace this level 1 uh, sword with the level 2 sword. And by the way, every time you level up, all equipment that is lower than your current level scales down in value. And that's how the game attempts to achieve permanent, always-on scaling of everything. Every piece of content in this game is always scaled to your level. And it accomplishes this by having lower level stuff, like lower level armor and weapons and whatnot, scale away from you. Um, and then your at level material is going to be sort of 100% value, if that makes sense. So the as level 1, I think the level 1 iron sword was like 1024 or something. And now it's 1013. I don't remember what it was. But we're going to see later plenty of examples of this exact phenomenon. So throw that on there. This can just honestly get destroyed because it's only worth zero, so no big deal. We'll put the uh, the maple shield on as well. This does have a cool unique description, the exile shield, but it's not worth anything, so it doesn't matter if I keep it or not, so let's just destroy it. And then, um, we'll put the gauntlets on first because we have some new gauntlets, level 2 gauntlets. These are all um, elven style gauntlets, so we're going to look very elvish in just a minute here. We'll throw on everything, and uh, let's unlock the heavy armor skill line as we get the rest of the stuff on here. As I said before, you need to have three pieces of an armor type to unlock the skill line involved. And boom, we've got ourselves a fully armored up uh, Cascus here, so pretty good. Now again, level one, uh, common, no enchantment, this can just get destroyed. I'm going to keep this, though, from earlier because I can, dis I can learn the training thing for light legs from this. Um, I don't remember the term for that. It's not deconstruction. I think it's just called, uh, like, learning a trait. But whatever the case. And then over here, by the way, our craft bag's been accumulating all this random junk we've been picking up. Um, nothing really to note. It's just over here in the craft bag. Okay, so we've got ourselves the heavy armor skill line now. And we can actually read really quick what the default modifiers are. There's a bunch of passives we can spend points to unlock. And there's an ability we can get at rank 22. You earn XP in this uh, skill, by the way, by um, wearing this armor and, and being in combat, getting XP with it on. In terms of bonuses, each piece of heavy armor, so this is per piece. We have, at the minute, because shields don't count as um, armor for, for like heaviness purposes, they're a type of armor in a way, but this doesn't count as heavy armor. We've got seven pieces, because it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we've got seven pieces of heavy armor, and that's how this is going to be calculated. But each piece, so all these are times by seven, um, reduces damage taken from martial attacks, which is physical attacks. Increases the damage that we block by 1%. And then, of course, a sword and shield blocks more as well. Uh, increases damage done with bashing by 30. So that's worth noting. And reduces the damage taken while immune to crowd control uh, by 1%. So in circumstances where we make ourselves or become immune to crowd control, we get a damage reduction of 7% with these bonuses. Remember, it's 1% per piece. Penalties. Increases damage taken from magical attacks. We take more damage, especially from spells. Spells are often more bursty, and then physical attacks are more sustain, if you know what that means. Uh, reduces movement speed of sprint, or the movement speed bonus of sprint. So we still move faster while sprinting, but we don't move as much faster in heavy armor, 7% less. Reduce, or rather increases the cost of roll dodge by 3% per piece. So it's 15% more to do this action in combat, or really any time. You can see how much we uh, zoom through our stamina rolling around in heavy armor, so that you know makes sense and increases the size of your detection area while sneaking. You can sneak around in a full set of heavy armor, but you're not going to be very stealthy. And I have to do some really precise like maneuvering to play stealthily in heavy armor. It's really not designed for it. That's a medium armor thing, not a heavy armor thing. So we will do a little bit of stealth here and there, but I'm largely not going to do too much of it while in heavy armor for what are obvious reasons. Let's continue along here. We're nearly outside. I actually didn't expect to see another player in this area. I thought that you first encountered the other players in the tutorial once you go outside, but I guess that one person was uh, somehow phasing into my my interior area. I don't know how that happened, but that's fine. Let's just continue searching the containers. And this may seem a little tedious, but again, um, this is all about building up a giant bank of materials so that I never have to buy materials at extreme inflated prices from uh, guild traders, from other players. Because uh, you can't buy most materials from NPCs. Actually, we're not quite outside yet. There's one more section here. I forgot about this. We're going to learn how sprinting works. So watch for the pop-up in just a minute here. There it is. I knew it. Alright, so 
any other stuff on the side here. Also, you can see outside there's some shenanigans happening out there. Do that just to get that off the screen. Maybe pick up some water. What's nice as well is that um, having a bunch of extra materials that you don't end up using isn't a bad thing. If I were to make other characters, I could trade my materials between my characters really easily. So there's always a use you can find for materials like that. All right, looking good. Pick this all up. Outside we go. Let's see if there's a whole crowd of people waiting for my arrival. Right. The entrance to the no. Kirai's gallery should be east of here. Let's head out. The adventure begins. Here we are in the in the exterior cell of the island of Belfiera. All right. Do I hold on? Slight. Are we? Is this? Is there anti-aliasing? Hold on. This is not. Okay. This would. This was not saved. I need to adjust this really quick. I, I did this before, but I guess it wasn't. Was it reset when I... Oh, you know what? That might have been... Is there, Everything else is the same, though, right? Yeah. Just the video settings. Okay, so sorry. This game probably did not look quite up to snuff for the first 50 minutes of this video. Sorry about that. I just noticed, because you can see it more easily outside. This is all wrong. I need to fix this all. Give me just a sec. Okay, there's the anti-aliasing. It was looking a bit jagged. Ugh. All right, so... Move that off. Make sure this is all set. Uh, this is all supposed to be on Ultra. I can I can run this game with everything at max, and no, that should not be a problem. Okay, there we go. That's a lot better. Um, circular. Okay, it's gonna take a sec to reload the, the graphics, but sorry about the first 50 minutes of a janky looking ESO. This game doesn't look the best, but now it's looking a lot better. There we go. Yeah, this should be fine. This should still go at 100 uh, FPS most of the time. All right, very good. Back at it. Continue looting all of the things. There we go. Okay. It's also not a bad thing just to build up a big stockpile of lockpicks, especially, because those are not necessarily easy to find. Um, if you're looking for them, you just find them randomly. Along with things like mint and these other provision, provisioning resources. Um, unless you want to spend hundreds if not thousands of gold to buy big sets of them from guilds. you just It's better just to pick them up in places like this early on. And uh, keep them saved up for the future. This opening tutorial area has many more like dense groups of containers than many other areas. So... Don't worry, this won't be the entire playthrough all the way through, although there will be a lot of this sort of thing. Just in time. Let me move your camera position. Yep. I know how that works. I find it kind of relaxing, honestly. It feels kind of nice to just loot everything. At least everything that you want to have. So we'll uh, just progress through here, check back here. Nothing escapes. Quintus Cascus. All right. And then, yeah, yeah, I want to go north, actually. This little side area. There's a golem over there. Let's uh, prepare for combat. I'll just run on in. Smash through the puncture. Block her attack. There we go. Nice and easy. Again, this is a tutorial, so combat's going to be extra easy here, on top of being easy as it is. Pick this butterfly some insect parts. Let's go fight this uh, stone saber cat. We have some healing as well from uh, Norian Way to help us out too. Just in case you're having trouble in combat in this opening area, she helps you out. It's certainly nice. And again, if I didn't really explain it well earlier, I'm starting with heavy armor, not because I'll be playing with heavy armor the whole game, but so that I level heavy armor first when it's easiest to level things. So I can sort of stop using heavy armor and then switch over to what I will probably use most of the game, which is light and medium armor. Probably probably light armor next, because I think medium armor is going to be my long-term build. But uh, I want to eventually level up all the different skill lines, so we are really going for a comprehensive thing here. That's the idea. All right, also there's a bear trap. Let me disarm that. Let's go kill this uh, golem champion. 
but the attackers are just dodged away from that. There's no random that way. She just disappeared. Alright, so before the guy respawns, let's uh, search this little area that he was guarding. Could be some good stuff in here, you never know. Are we level 3 yet? I think I'm just still level 2. Yeah, we're still level 2. So no need to pick up any of the uh, the armor or weapons. They haven't scaled up to level 3 yet. They're all going to be level 2. So we already have a full set of level oops, full set of level 2 equipment as it is. So Sometimes armor and weapons on in the world like this could uh, uh, get picked up and be enchanted, but that's pretty uncommon. It's really not worth it to check every single one. If I did that, I'd be... I would increase the amount of time that I spend looting areas by like 5 times. That's not fun for anybody, so I'll pick up stuff by accident sometimes that I can just, uh, destroy it like that nice and quick. Nothing to worry about. Um, just like that. Alright. I've been uh, doing this kind of uh, play style for so many years. It's uh, muscle memory at work here. Oh. Oh my gosh, there she is. Noriano is phasing in and out of reality, which is, interestingly, uh, a lore accurate way that she could be experiencing her situation right now given what's happening on this island. We'll talk about that more in a bit uh, once we finish the tutorial. We're going to see what's going on here. So, some, <laughs> some uh, crazy magical shenanigans happening here. But on we go. Let's kill some more of these stone cats. Yeah, so check out the distance on my melee attacks. This is all melee range, right? Melee range. So you can play a melee character and, and basically backstep away and be pretty safe. Now remember, everyone's melee range is like that, so the enemies will hit you too. So don't be surprised with like distant enemy melee attacks hitting you. Remember, like this right here, this is melee range. As long as you're actually facing them and they're sort of hitbox, you're gonna hit. So those are all clearly like several meters away, but this all counts for melee combat in this game. So it's just something you get used to. It's definitely like pretty weird at first, but you know, this is an MMO, and if this is the compromise for the game to otherwise run pretty well, given how much is going on in this game, how large the player base is, and how large the world is, I will take it. <laughs> I'll sacrifice melee realism for this game for it to be of the scale it is. Oh, look at this. Let's feed at Shar. Someone's been playing Baldur's Gate 3. Very nice. Let's see, what are you up to? This is, I think, a high elf. I investigate this guy? I want to see what he's up to. I can't investigate him. Alright. He looks like a high elf to me. Based on the, uh, the limited part of him that I can see. So, fair enough. I'm going to leave the other side of this area after I come back out, because I have to go check something inside first before we The Kiroid's along. gallery is in here. Let's head inside. Alright. So let's uh, enter the gallery, see what's going on in here. I'm going to loot this whole interior later, because I'm going to come back here later in the tutorial, so... We'll just follow Dorian way up here first. And she notably is slower than me, so I'm just stuck behind her. That's fine. Well, this is upsetting. Jeffers bones. The surge of magicka created by the portals you came through. Ugh, must have cracked this sky shard. Without a functioning sky shard, this gate remains locked, and there's no way for us to proceed. Damn! Is there any way to fix it? Unless you have a set of enchanting tools and a working knowledge of meteoric empowerment theory, no, there's nothing for it. We need to find a replacement. Where can we find a replacement sky shard? I saw one in a vault just south of here a few days ago, but it was flanked by one of the island's more powerful golems. Normally, I'd say we should search for another option, but given the circumstances, I think we have to risk it. All right, let's find that sky shard. Can I ask you something before we set out? Of course. Let's not tarry too long, though. What are sky shards, exactly? Giant clusters of meteoric glass. They fall from Aetherius, charged with raw and very potent magicka. Mages use sky shards in all kinds of rituals and experiments. We Dureni use them as a power source. What kind of golem did you see near the sky shard? It's a monstrous sentinel called a gargoyle. I've never seen one fight, but by all accounts, they are far more powerful than the golems we faced thus far. Great. <laughs> That's uh, reassuring. Well, I guess uh, we've got to fight it <laughs> to get to the Sky Shard, probably. Yeah, in ESO, if anyone ever says there might be danger, there's probably danger. That is a safe bet in the world of Tamarilla. Hello. 
it's a uh, char once again. Right, so we're, again, we're gonna loot this area once I come back here because we have to go retrieve the sky shard first. Plus, we can pick up some stuff at level three. We're gonna level up probably as we go over here. All right. Do you see that vault right, to the south? First, first. The sky shard is there. Any good stuff around here? Oh, here we go. So you find these recipes sometimes, so it is worth to look in every container. Because those recipes are worth hundreds of gold to buy from NPCs and more to buy from players. So we're going to save ourselves quite a bit of money just being thorough like this. Yeah, so I know that this, this part may be kind of hard to stomach and some of you will be turned off by the amount of looting that I'm doing. But it really is just good for my completeness and to get um, all the stuff that I need for power leveling crafting later so that we don't get bogged down in the crafting meta <laughs> in this playthrough. This isn't a playthrough about being um, a super thorough crafter, it's about just uh, it's more focusing in on the storytelling and the quests and whatnot, so I'll do the crafting stuff as part of my character progression, but I don't want to get too distracted by that. Go ahead and just uh, kill this guy here. Also, enemies in this game, the ones that are hostile that have a red name, are there's a pretty generous amount of room given. Also, here's an example, by the way. This shoe that dropped from an enemy, uh, weapons and armor that drop from enemies that you kill, even uh, common verity, so white uh, color, um, will often have uh, some gold value to them. So this is five gold, so it's worth picking this up, even if I'm not gonna wear it, because I can sell that for some gold. So just a note there. All right, let's do some more combat over here. We could actually fight both these guys at once, but may as well just do it one at a time. No need to uh, do anything too complicated here. Level three, there we go. We get ourselves one bound crown fortifying meal. We'll talk about these gourmet dishes some other time. I will just grab that. Nothing too complicated. And as for our skill point, I'm just going to save it for now as I want to get all three necromancer skills simultaneously and level. I said this earlier. I want to level all three of these skill lines at the same time, which is hard to set up if I don't get the skills at the same time as each other. So I need three skill points to do that in one go, which I'll just wait and have enough skill points by the end of the tutorial shouldn't be a huge problem. So we're going to miss out on seeing these Necromancer skills right away, but trust me, we will get them. So for now, we're basically just playing a warrior with no magic at all, but never fear, Quintus Cascus the Necromancer will be revealed uh, before too long. We're uh, making our way in that direction. All right, come on, please. Loot the urn, very good. Fight these guys. It's good to get some practice. I haven't played DSM in a while, so not that I'm necessarily super rusty, but also getting more of this. Um... Actually, hold on, wait. Uh... You can see, by the way, uh, this sword was 1025 before. Now that we're level 3, it's only 1001. So it actually is better to actually equip the dagger as our main weapon, as weird as that sounds, because it's more damage than the sword, so. Yeah, this is our new weapon setup. Looks a bit bizarre, but that's what the numbers say, so we're going to follow what the numbers are telling us. Alright, in we go. Let's go and find out what's going on in the Sky Shard Vault. Probably nothing good. Almost surely nothing good, but we'll find out. Alright, uh, move over here. Got ourselves some armor upgrades. We can pick this with level 3 armor, see what we can grab. Possibly not everything we want, but we, there's a couple things here. Some gauntlets as well. The else on the floor. This, the rest of the stuff is medium armor. You can tell by the names. All right, so what do we have here? Okay, as you can see, by the way, same thing with armor. So 1,162 for the level 2 hands, 1,194 for the level 3 hands. So we'll just replace that. It's all elven style, so it's the same no matter what. Same thing with the, the Quiris, Reeves. Actually, this is a medium helm, so I grabbed that by accident, so we'll just toss this extra stuff, and there we go. Not that these small differences matter at the minute. Um, we could there probably be in level 1 armor until level 50 and be fine, honestly, but it's worth doing it just to keep the, uh, what do I try to say, to keep the, um, the sort of muscle memory there. Also, if we can, if you can get out of the way in Orient way, I kind of want to grab a better melee weapon if there is one here. It's one of first person to see here. It's kind of dark at the minute. Uh, what do we have here? Anything? No. What's our shield? Is our shield level 3? You know, let's grab a level 3 shield, actually. 
can also, by the way, play this game in first person, which uh, I don't normally do because this is very much a game that is best played in third person. But every so often it may hop into third person. You'll notice, by the way, how short my character is. He's actually on the short side for an Imperial, who's already, a, which is already a race that's a little bit on the shorter side. That's just kind of a fun design quirk with him. It's not meant to mean anything specific, but I suppose we'll fight this guy in first person just to show how this goes. You'll see in a minute why first person combat is not necessarily the most sustainable, because this is what's going to look like. Impossible to really see anything after dogs, the ground stuff here. And I just, I don't have the situational awareness to uh, play like this super consistently. Third, first person does work fine if you're playing as a ranged character, like a spellcaster or an archer. But in melee combat, first person is just kind of a mess to keep track of. And I'd rather just play in third person, to be honest. But first person is an option. All the animations have first person versions, uh, blocking, attacking. And every kind of like thing is a first person model, so it's there if we want to try it out. Not going to play with it too often, though. But that is one nice thing about this being an, an Elder Scrolls uh, MMO, is that they have that first person mode that the Elder Scrolls games made really famous for the RPGs. All right, so let's uh, continue searching around here before we get to the Sky Shard. The Raider's gonna keep coming in my in my way here. That's fine. All right, so more good stuff to grab. I'm pressing R, by the way, um, to uh, to loot all. That's what I'm doing with my my key clicks. If you're wondering how I'm closing these, it's by pressing the loot all button to quickly grab it. That's actually not great. Let me throw that on. It's Khajiit style. Interesting. Alright, let's go ahead and grab the Sky Shard. We're going to uh, do a T pose. Very nice. What? Did you just absorb the energy of that shard? I sure did. Incredible. Not quite what I intended, but we can work with this. Let's head back to the gate. Alright, first let me loot your. Your, your entire room here. Sorry about that. But, uh, future me will be thankful that I put this work in. You know what? Hold on. Here we go. Yeah, level three. What do we have here? I thought I saw Sam Thomas. Yep. Alright. I grab this. I did. The last couple things in this room. Again, the chance at finding a recipe that saves us a couple hundred gold makes doing this extra stuff feel worth it to me. And it helps me, you know, really just take my time with this game. There's so much content, it's so tempting to just rush through to see everything, but each area is so well detailed, right? This is a pretty, like, not just pretty, this is a very high quality MMO in terms of the level of detail on top of the scale of everything, so. It's worth it, you know, this is a beautiful game. It's worth it to take your time and just kind of play through, not just run through at breakneck pace to get to the end game. The questing is such a fun part of it. That's one of the whole points of this playthrough, by the way, for YouTube, is to really showcase the questing, which so many people ignore, and they just focus on the end game and doing the, the late game stuff, which is really fun. But this game has so much leveling content that people just don't really care about. So, speaking of uh, doing content people may not care about, let me continue looting these areas here. Like, can I find a, uh, oh, here we go, sword. It's gonna be the same uh, damage. Yeah, um, all one-handed weapons, no matter what they look like or what type they are, have the same damage profile without other modifiers, so it's gonna just look better to use this. It's not really better than the dagger, so that's fine. Go over here, anything else over in this corner. Honestly, these urns being, uh, having nothing in them is fine by me because I, if I, if there's a chance that there's something in them, I want to check them, but if there's nothing in them, I can just sort of move past. Helps with my OCD <laughs> to just not bother with them, but so there's another character here. Bill's blown, all right. Okay. Continue searching around. Here. Looks fine. Let's check over here. 
By the way, if you if you do again, speaking of like looking at everything in a slower way, look at the detail on this armor. This is actually pretty good modeling here. Like you can see if you look really close how there's like so much fine detail in the texture here. This is a really cool suit of armor. But yeah, anyways. This game just has so much like going on when you really look into it. That's something I love about it. Alright, and then let's check over here. Floor level for no, not that. here just to check everything. Early on, any bit of gold we can get is going to be helpful, so it is worth my time to gather all this ash to sell to merchants. It's going to be good. Yeah, alright. And uh, I guess what I'm going to mention right now while I'm doing this is that my, my game plan for the Order of the Alliances, so I'm going to start with Daggerfall Covenant because this is a Daggerfall Covenant aligned character. Even though the Imperial race isn't part of any of the factions directly, um, for story reasons we'll talk about later, the Imperial like civilization has collapsed and they're all kind of all over the place in a big diaspora. So this character here is going to be Daggerfall aligned for like PvP purposes and sort of for story purposes. We'll get into a story more later, but I'm in the Daggerfall Covenant as my actual sort of in-game faction. I'll do their, their uh, five zones first, starting with uh, Glenumbra. Te or technically starting with Stros Makai after the uh, main game tutorial, which is after this tutorial. This game has multiple tutorials. <laughs> um, and then my plan is to do, so Daggerfall Covenant first, and then I'm probably going to do... Um, uh, I'll, I'll probably do um, Ebonheart Pack second, and then I'll do Aldenary Dominion third. In my, in my recollection, I remember the Aldenary Dominion having the best storyline, so I'm going to save that one for last. Um, all three factions have their own strengths and weaknesses, so it's not a clear cut like one's better than every other one. But I the Daggerfall Covenant feels like a good starting one because it's the most normal of the of the three. Um, it's the most familiar. If you're not an Elder Scrolls veteran like me, it's going to be the one that's the most familiar to like a standard medieval RPG experience with you know sort of European style civilizations and, and kings and, and intrigue and diplomacy. That's the um, Daggerfall Covenant experience. And it's got some pretty solid stories to be sure. So it's not like, just because it's more traditional doesn't make it bad. The other two factions are pretty interesting and are very like Elder Scrollsy, if that makes sense. All right, moment of truth. Which I love Focus on the Sky Shard Aperture. With any luck, right. it'll respond to the power you have. Ha, you did it. Let's speak for a moment. All right. I'm afraid we've reached the really scary bit. The Daedric creature responsible for all these portals waits just beyond that gate. If you have any other preparations to make, make them now. Do you have any advice on how to slay this thing? Again, I'm just a scholar, but I'd encourage you to remember what we practiced before. Keep moving, strike true, and exploit any opening the creature gives you. Right. Okay, our first little boss fight uh, for this game. Um, shouldn't be too complicated. There are a few mechanics, but not too worried. Let's go for it. There it is. Send it right. back to oblivion. If I die on this boss fight, I'm deleting my channel. <laughs> I said it. You hold me to it. Should not be a serious concern, but <laughs> not too worried. I do like the double health bar situation on the top of the screen. Actually, a third one as well over the guy. Or over the girl? A gender unclear demon monster. It's got boobs, so probably a girl? I don't know. If Shizel wants to stop uh, destroying this island, I will listen to whatever their preferred gender identity happens to be, but I don't think they're going to tell me. Gonna just put that line of questioning. End right there and just end this boss fight. All right. Only I will remain. Should be power through the rest here. There we go. All right. Did not die. Did not have to delete my channel. That's a relief. <laughs> Hopefully the gallery wasn't too badly damaged. Follow me. All right. Mercifully, this room has nothing to loot, so I can just leave here. Although first, I'm gonna go ahead and throw 
this uh, health boosting necklace on. That's a bit nice. Increase health by 888. While at level 3, it's going to get lower as we level up, so that's fine. All right, now, uh, the looting is about to get a lot more in intense because there's a, a massive room full of a bajillion containers coming up here, so just uh, brace yourselves for one last big hurrah of massive amounts of looting. <laughs> I, w I wish I wasn't like this. You know, it feels like... It's like I'm cursed. I'm, I I'm suffer from the curse of being a min-maxer, even when it comes to looting. I, knowing something has the possibility of loot, I, I cannot let it slip me by. I have to check. I have to loot. I'm just... It, it, it afflicts me every day. I, I wake up in a cold sweat thinking, did I miss that urn? Not, not, not really, not that part, but it is like a, it is like a curse. I, I can't stop doing it. Why all the stars? Look at the central column. I had no idea it was concealing something like this. Wait. Let's get a closer look. What is... What's happening with that one? Okay, let's, let's go see what's going on with that one. That one may be a big glitch. But yes, yeah, so this is the uh, the portal room. And this is a really cool idea that I like how they, they've done this with this tutorial. So if you don't know, this tutorial isn't the original tutorial of the game, which we actually will be playing that after this tutorial for story reasons. But this tutorial was added with... Which one added this one? This was added with High Isle, I believe. And that's the, the most recent expansion before Necrom, which is the current expansion. I think I'm saying that right. Or I think I'm remembering that right. And what this this tutorial in this room does is you can basically start any expansion or the main story by your choice and start over in the, that area. I think I said this before, but this game has a big focus on being very sort of open and horizontal. So all the different content is uniform and you being able to start there. And a lot of the newer content is more new player friendly because it was made by a more experienced, you know, developer at the end of the day. But um, I'm going to start with the oldest content and sort of do everything in release order. That's the plan at the minute. And just the release content, like the, the beginning content, the, the three main, um, the three main five zone storylines, so 15 zones in total for the three factions will take a huge portion of this playthrough just by itself because it's so much content there. But then after that, each expansion is going to have its own set of zones that have one really cohesive central storyline. Lots of like a great lore and writing there, but we have to get there first through the, um, the opening stuff because although things are generally designed to not be cumulative, so the stories of each zone are sort of self-contained, there are some characters that reappear in later expansion zones, and there's only inconsistent success in having it like sort of scale with your progression with their stories in the earlier zones correctly. I don't know if that makes sense at all. Maybe not. But for the sake of everything being narratively cohesive in a way that I can control, we're going to do all the narratives in their release order. So the chance of spoiler character appearances or... Because one time I played this game a long time ago and I encountered a character... Without getting into details, I encountered a character essentially in Hell who told me about another character who died in a battle. And that battle actually happens in a zone that I hadn't played yet, because I was doing the hell thing a little out of order, and I didn't know that I was, so... <laughs> well, I'll get back to that later. <laughs> I'll explain in the future how, how and why that was happening, but... Um, basically, there are instances where you can get little spoilers like that, and the game tries its best to not have that happen, but... In a game as enormous as this one, that's going to happen sooner or later, so... The best thing I can do is just play everything in the release order so that our chance of encountering spoiler scenarios are limited to the extent possible. But you know what, actually, hold on. I should have done this earlier. I didn't think about this. NPCs have else should be turned on. Now NPCs talking in the distance, not in conversation with me, they're going to have their subtitles pop up. I guess not that time. Oh, there it is. Here we are in the main room here. So these are all different portals to different uh, zones and expansions. And we could, I'm not going to look at all of them because this would spoil many of the expansion concepts. And also it would take like 40 minutes to, to look at and talk about every different starting section. But the point here is you get player freedom. And I have a particular and sort of weird opening way I'm going to approach this. I'm going to start with the Daggerfall Covenant main storyline, which will send me to Stros Mackay, which is the... This is getting complicated. That is the the first of two tutorial zones 
not including this tutorial and not including the base game vanilla tutorial, which is its own separate area. So there's going to essentially be four tutorials, not including the other tutorials for all the other expansions that we're not going to see. So we're, in, we're finishing the first tutorial. We're going to then go to Stress Mackay, but then leave and go to Daggerfall and start the second tutorial. Once that finishes, we get put on Stress Mackay. We then do the Stress Mackay tutorial zone, and then we'll get, we're going to do the Betnik tutorial zone after that. So hope you were taking notes, because this will be on the test later. The point is, we're going to be dealing with a lot of uh, opening tutorial zones in succession here. But fortunately, remember, everything is scaling with me, so we're not necessarily going to deal with... Um, you know, repeating tutorial mechanic things every single time. It's just tutorial in the sense that it's sort of easier and more compact. The first full real zone we're going to be encountering is Glenumbra, which we'll get to probably in like 10 hours or something, which is crazy. And the first main capital city is a Daggerfall, so we're going to be getting there eventually, but for now we've got this stuff to kind of power our way through. But we're getting all of our opening abilities and whatnot, so we're getting a chance to sort of uh, see the basics before we get deep into the Glenumbra stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll crack open the map later on and show you kind of like the the general plan of progression just for you visual learners out there. I'm one of you, so I, I understand your pain with me just explaining everything while I run around looting a bajillion urns. Yeah, I yearn to no longer have an urn to look at or loot, but uh, that is not uh, the situation that I'm in. The urns call to me, they whisper my name, Daedric like, and I must open them and peer inside. What I see inside is my own time being wasted, but, and probably all of your time being wasted as well, but my future self will appreciate the work I put in early on get all this crap and have it stored for future use. Especially all the jewelry I'm finding. That's going to help with my jewelry crafting training quite a bit, so that can't be uh, too bad to, to do there. Something else I like about this tutorial and this idea of the portal room is there's so many empty slots for future expansions to go have portals for, so they really future-proof themselves. Like this tutorial is, and it's setting on this island, is completely disconnected from the rest of the game. Nothing that happened in this tutorial substantively ever comes up again in any way that I can think of. And so this can basically be the tutorial of the game for the next 10 years as well. And they can just keep adding more portals as new expansions are added in. Because again, this game is all about horizontal equality. Each piece of content is doable at the same time as other pieces of content. In fact, the entire game, despite it being 10 real years of new content, the, in the game, the the year is uh, two eighty uh, second era two eighty two, and it's been second era two eighty two since the game launched. You know, ten years ago in real life. So in the game lore, all of the events happening at this point in time are happening simultaneously. So it's a bit weird. Time being a bit weird in the game is actually also lore appropriate for other reasons we'll talk about later. But basically, this game does some goofy stuff with the timeline. And as the game progresses and there's more content, lore purists like me continue to have more and more severe headaches trying to make sense of how this game works in the timeline. Spoilers, it basically doesn't, and I think there's a strong argument that this game essentially can't be seen as canon to the main franchise because of how much, at this point, with all the different pieces of content, things have been stretched and kind of, you know, messed with. And, um well-respected, established YouTube, Elder Scrolls lore purists, won't name any names here, but if you know the community, you know who I'm talking about, have often said that ESO is flatly non-canon and therefore sort of doesn't matter, but, and I'll, I'll get more into the depth of my hottest Elder Scrolls Online takes, which will come later, but one thing I will say for now is that even if ESO isn't canon in Elder Scrolls lore because of all the things it does to make it work as an MMO, None of the Elder Scrolls games are canon either, because they all make compromises. They're showing worlds that have, like, small size cities compared to the lore. So every game is already not canon. And many people have, including me, pointed out how, for example, Skyrim is super different from Elder Scrolls lore in really important story-relevant ways. So in my opinion, what I care about is not so much lore accuracy one-to-one, -one, which no game will ever do for a setting like Elder Scrolls, but more so like theme accuracy and good writing. And I think ESO is way better at, in these areas than people give it credit. 
In fact, I think ESO is very underrated as a Elder Scrolls storytelling experience. And the quest writing here is generally very good. And that's what I hope this playthrough will help demonstrate to everybody on YouTube. That ESO deserves to be in the conversation about good writing in the Elder Scrolls franchise. Anyways, I think I've uh, searched the entirety of this room. <laughs> Finally, let's talk to Norianway. See what she has to say. Can you believe this? Just look around. With this arcane helix exposed, the chamber is positively <coughs> crackling with magic. The Kirai's gallery has come to life, and I finally think I know why. What do you mean? Why did it come to life? Because of you. Matters in Tamriel are bleak. War rages in Cyrodiil. Daedric princes conspire. Dragons ride the winds of elsewhere. The second era needs a savior. I believe the gallery. Perhaps even the Adamantine Tower itself chose you. Yeah, so if you, you haven't figured it out by now, because I've mentioned it a little bit here and there, this game takes place in the second era. So this is about a thousand years before Skyrim, maybe a bit less than that. It's a long time before Skyrim. In fact, we're actually hundreds of years, because we're in second era of, uh, eight, or sorry, yeah, eight, 852, or no, sorry, 582, there we go. <laughs> Second era 582. We're also hundreds of years before Tiber Septim, aka Talos, who famously united the Empire together. Now, one of the s several retcons that I am fine with, uh, because it makes sense, is that Tiber Septim, before this game, was sort of perceived as beginning essentially what we think of as the Empire, and as an Imperial character, which is what my character is, this lore becomes relevant. What ESO does is it recontextualizes the idea that there's been multiple empires that look like the Empire, and the future from now, Tiber Septim's Empire, is, I think it's called the Third Empire, because it also coincides with the Third Era, the era which ends with the game Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion with Elder Scrolls V happening in the Fourth Era, just so everyone's clear. So basically, we're pre-Skyrim, we're pre-Oblivion, pre-Morrowind. We're actually hundreds of years even before Arena and Daggerfall, which also take place right before Oblivion. Or around, yeah, about, about right before Oblivion. So basically, all the lore in this game is in a prequel context to the rest of the franchise. This is not set after Skyrim, it's set way before Skyrim. And um, we'll talk more about how this game works and doesn't work as a prequel to the rest of the content in the franchise. I mostly think it works, but I understand the many, many, many complaints by lore uh, sort of um, extremists, or that's kind of a loaded way to phrase that, lore purists, how about that, who don't like how this game handles uh, the lore of the franchise. But all I will say is that even the lore darling game of Morrowind, which is probably my favorite Elder Scrolls game from a lore point of view, it also makes compromises to work as a game with the lore that it's working with. Anyways, uh, putting all that aside, I guess this whole time we've had this very, very sad-looking Norianway. I don't know why she's looking at me with this giant frown, but she's just like, <laughs> like she's giving me puppy dog. I don't know why she has this expression. She's just very sad right now. She's sad thinking about everything happening in Tamriel. By the way, if you're thinking, wait a minute, dragons and elsewhere? What? What? What was that about dragons? We're gonna get to that later, like in hundreds of hours when I play the Elsewhere expansion, which has dragons. And yes, I will talk about all the problems with that, with the lore, but I can't, I can't talk about the dragons yet. I'm going to lose my mind if I talk about the dragons already. I have the rest of the next thousand hours to prepare to talk about the dragons and elsewhere. We're going to get to that later. First, what do you think I should do next? The Kirites Gallery opened doors to every corner of Tamriel, places I suspect that desperately need a hero's aid. This choice is yours to make, but wherever you choose to go, I'm sure adventure awaits. May the stars protect you. All right. So, have you chosen where to go? What region of the world strikes your fancy? Not everyone gets to pass instantly from one side of Tamriel to another, you know. This is quite a gift. Any thoughts on where I should go? It is a bit overwhelming, isn't it? The whole of Tamriel is stretched out before you. We could start with the political considerations. Three great alliances vie for control of Cyrodiil. Does the fate of the Pact, Covenant, or Dominion interest you? Uh, I don't really want to have her get into all the storylines, which I'll sort of preview here, as that would just make this uh, part of the video just so bloated. So let me just actually back away slowly and not talk to her about that. So, um, I already said my plan. I'm going to uh, Strauss Mackay, technically, but I'll actually then go to Daggerfall 
do the Soul Shriven tutorial, let's just say, and then I'll go back to Source McKay and do that. So, first of all, we got our reward for this tutorial quest. We have a bow, which I'm going to keep to um, dismantle. Heavy armor, which I will actually just equip. Flame staff, I'll dismantle. Yeah, okay. We also got a soul gem. Soul gems let you either revive yourself upon death or revive a player or companion when they're dead. And also to charge uh, weapon enchantments when they start to uh, um, run out. Um, enchantments on armor and shields are permanent, but weapons use up their enchantment um, sort of amount as they're used. So you have to recharge them with soul gems. Soul gems are very easy to get, um, but it is worth keeping on top of this because if you don't have soul gems and you have an enchanted weapon that runs out of juice and you can't get more, more soul gems right away, you're going to have a really bad time because it's going to really depower your weapon. So whatever the case, we do have a second skill point, but again, I'm saving up my three to do these three at the same time. But I now have the soul magic line as well, so I do have the soul trap ability activated right away as an uh, available ability. So Soul Trap costs Magicka to cast. It has a 20 second duration. Notice the 28 meters, this is a ranged ability. Cast on an enemy. Lay claim to an enemy's soul dealing 8,206 magic damage over 20 seconds, so it's a damage over time. And here's the important part, fill an empty soul gem if the enemy dies while it's afflicted. So as long as you cast this on anyone that's not a boss, you're gonna probably kill them in 20 seconds at least, unless you are like fighting a mob of people and you're switching your attention around. I usually just cast this before I kill something, if I have some empty soul gems. If I don't have any empty soul gems on me, this doesn't do anything extra, but it is still a solid damage over time to throw on, if nothing else, and I may as well have it on the bar to level it up as I'm playing. Alright, um, that looks fine. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just immediately go over to Sturce Makai. No, it's not over there, there it is. And just to teleport over, um, I could look at every portal and get a special bit of dialogue from Norian Way talking about what that story would be, but again, I don't want to overload you all with all the premises of all the different expansions. It's here for you to pick as a, someone browsing which story to begin, but I have a particular plan in place. So I guess I'll talk, I'll look at the map now and talk about this. So basically here's the plan. So we're going to go to Stros Mackay, which is this island here, but then we're going to immediately travel over to Glenumbra, to the city of Daggerfall, which is the capital of the Daggerfall Covenant, the faction that I'm in. We're going to then start the tutorial of the main base game for the Daggerfall Covenant storyline. After that, uh, we'll be teleported from the, that tutorial back to Stros Mackay. We're going to do Stros Mackay, then we go to Betnik, which is the second of the two Daggerfall Covenant tutorials. We're going to do Betnik, then we're going to go back and return once again to Glenumbra and do the Glenumbra zone entirely. And if you're noticing how large this zone looks, yep, welcome to Elder Scrolls Online. After Glenumbra, it will be Stormhaven, which is another, you know, fully sized zone with... Actually, I think I misspoke earlier. Daggerfall, the city, isn't the capital of the Covenant. Um, it's sort of the namesake, but the capital is actually the larger city of Wayrest, which is where I will eventually buy a house. I have a particular house in mind over here. There's a great house in Wayrest, but it's going to be very expensive, hundreds of thousands of gold, so I have to save up for that. But whatever the case, we'll do a Stormhaven. Then we do uh, the third of the five zones in the storyline, Riven Spire. Then from there, we go over to Alakir Desert, do this zone. Finally, we do Bang Karai, which is the fifth and final zone of the Daggerfall Covenant storyline. Then we're going to do the Ebonheart Pack storyline, starting with their tutorial island, Bleak Rock Isle. Then we go down and do the second tutorial zone that they have, Balfoyan. Then Stone Falls. Then after that is Deshaun with their capital, Mornhold. Uh, after this, we then go over to, uh, where is it, Shadowfen, which is Ed the Swamp. Very fun. Then we go to Eastmark, so if you're a Skyrim player, this is going to look familiar. This is where Windhelm is in this time period, so you're going to see some familiar sights. Then we end with the Rift, a fan favorite, including the city of Riften. Very nice. And then um, after this, we're going to do the Aldmeri Dominion uh, full storyline, starting with uh, their singular, they don't have two, they only have one tutorial island, Canarthi's Roost, but it's extra large. It's two tutorial islands worth of tutorial island and one tutorial island. It's a tutorial island more than I ever thought I would say in one sentence, but there we go. After Canarthi's Roost, we then whoop, go all the way over to Oridon, which is their first full zone. We do, whoops, we do Oridon. Then we go over to Grotwood with their capital, Elden Root. 
These guys were doing the Elden thing before Elden Ring. And my name's Alden, so I'm doing the Alden thing. And I was doing that before they were doing the Elden thing, and before <laughs> Elden Ring was doing the Elden thing. So I get to say that I'm the first one there, as it were. <sighs> I don't know why anyone watches my content, but <laughs> we'll go check out Elden Root, which is a giant tree, if you can't tell by this picture, which looks like a giant tree. And actually, uh, the entirety of Grotwood is full of giant trees. This is all Valen Woods. This is the Wood Elf homeland. It's a big jungle, basically. Then we go to Greenshade, which is the third zone. After this, we go to Malabal Tor, which is the fourth zone. And the coolest name of any zone, arguably, of these early zones. Finally, we get to Reaper's March, which is also a very cool name for a zone. And this is uh, connected up with part of Elsewhere. Then we start doing the uh, DLC and expansion content. I, what I want to do, actually, is do Rothgar first, because... This will kind of be a nice return to the Covenant area. This is not part of the Daggerfall Covenant main story. It's its own DLC zone. I want to do it after I do everything else, uh, even though I could do it right after finishing Bang Karai, and it would make lots of sense it's nearby, but Rothgar is its own full experience. Um, I'm trying to remember the order of everything. I think after Rothgar, uh, we're probably going to want to do Craiglorm next. And after Craiglorm, and throughout all this, we're going to be doing Cyrodiil here and there, because Cyrodiil is a PvP zone. And it also has quests. And it's a, the largest questing zone with the quests that it does have. So I don't even know how I'm going to include Cyrodiil in this, but we will include Cyrodiil as we progress. Hopefully you're following along and not feeling overwhelmed yet. But anyways, uh, we're also going to do the uh, the Gold Coast, which is the Dark Brotherhood-oriented zone, with the Dark Brotherhood quest line happening here in this zone. It's also set in Cyrodiil, which is the homeland of my character, so that's quite nice. We're going to do Hughes Bane, which is the Thieves' Guild-oriented zone, and yeah, then again, Cyrodiil here and there. I don't remember the order of all the other DLC zones, but in general, the route is going to be... We're going to then do the Morrowind expansion, which was the first one over here in Vardenfell. Then we're going to do the Somerset expansion with the Somerset Island. Or Somerset Isle, I mean. Then after that will be... What's next after that one? Also, we're going to do Clockwork City around this time. And, oh, I forgot to mention Cold Harbor. We're going to do Cold Harbor after we do the three alliances. So this is happening before we do Rothgar. No, wait. Do we, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's, yeah, we do this before Rothgar. So sorry again for that confusion there. Um, okay, where was I? Somerset. After Somerset, we then do, what was after Somerset? Oh my god, I can't remember. Um, I think Merkmire's next. That sounds right to me. We do Merkmire next. This is deep in the swamp. This is deep Argonian stuff right here. And then after Merkmire, what's next after this? Um, I don't remember the order very well. It's offhand. We, oh, yeah, we also do our TAM as part of Somerset. After Merkmire, in some order that I'll find out later, I have a long time to get the order right. I've, I've literally probably do have hundreds of hours before I have to get this order correct. We're going to, in some order here, do the elsewhere zones of what in this... Uh, add-on is called Inequia and Pelotine. In the base game, this is Northern and Southern Elsewhere. Uh, we're going to do Blackwood, uh, which also includes the Deadlands from the game Oblivion. You can go there as well, and Fargrave. Um, we're going to do uh, Western Skyrim and the Reach, which is part of the Skyrim-oriented um, Grey March expansion, which also includes parts of Blackreach. And then, uh, what's left? I think I've covered almost everything. Um, we were going to do the High Isle area, which looks small, but if you actually click on it, this is an enormous zone. Something I like about this map is that um, each area, although it is sized appropriately for the lore, each of these areas is roughly the same size. Although the tutorial islands are actually about a third of the size, they look much smaller on the map. And places like the High Isles are actually similar in size when you really play in them to the actual main areas. But this is all lore size, not gameplay size. In the game, it's going to be gameplay sized. And then we're also going to do... Um, what's left? Oh, yeah, we're going to end... I mean, we're, there's probably going to be more content released before we even get here, but we'll, at the minute, our final area is going to be the Indoral Highlands, a.k.a. the Telvanni Peninsula in the unmodded game, with Apocrypha. We're going to be going there. So, needless to say, this is going to be a quick playthrough, only a couple episodes. We should get through it pretty efficiently. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's going to be a colossal playthrough with a, an unfathomable amount of content ahead of us for Quintus Cascus. So having said that, let's go to Stress Mackay for a quick second. We're not going to be here for very long. We're going to come back to Stress Mackay after we do the main tutorial. We have to, 
we have to start that tutorial through the Stros Mackay portal. So, here we go. Stros Mackay. Oh, it's a fascinating just <laughs> island with rich dwarven and red god history. Alas, it's been largely overrun by pirates. If the gallery elected to open a portal to the island, something extraordinary must be occurring there. So, ready to set out. Yep, we're going to travel to Stros Mackay and start the Daggerfall Covenant storyline. And it's very important if you want to play the storyline of your chosen faction that you sort of do this part correctly so you don't accidentally get sucked into the wrong faction storyline. It's pretty hard to screw this up because the game tells you which faction controls which territory here, but all the expansion stuff isn't really faction-based. It's just these those three main storylines, you know, Daggerfall Covenant, um, Ebonheart Pact, and uh, Aldmeri Dominion that are, you know, factional. But even then, anyone can play any of the storylines. Hence why, as a Daggerfall Covenant-aligned Imperial, I can just go over to those other lands and play their stories, even though it sort of doesn't make sense. However, it sort of, again, re-makes sense, because as an Imperial, I'm not technically like racially connected to the covenant although many characters of aligned races are in every faction because you know the factions are saying we represent in the case of the covenant bretons orcs and redguards but a whole bunch of bretons orcs and redguards for all sorts of reasons aren't part of the covenant and so it's not like 100 percent of every race is on board with their own faction but the factions represent those races interests sort of geopolitically so the Imperials, as a race, don't have a faction that sort of claims them completely because the the recent uh, sort of empire that they were part of has collapsed, which we're going to learn more about in a minute. So the Imperials are a diaspora splintered all over the place, and there's Imperials kind of in every faction doing different things. So playing as an Imperial helps sort of contextualize our faction hopping experience we're going to have as I progress through these storylines in sequence. So hopefully that all makes sense. Let's begin the storyline. We're going to get a little cinematic here uh, to help sort of contextualize the Daggerfall Covenant storyline, although it's mostly going to be the main storyline that this speaks on. It's going to have a few uh, little spoilers here and there, so avert your eyes if you want complete uh, protection from any main story, uh, main story spoilers, although it's only kind of in the sense of showing some shots and visuals from later in the main story, nothing that reveals what's going on, so it's just a cool little movie that they made. So let's go ahead and travel to Stress Mankai and start the Daggerfall Covenant storyline. We submit to your will and call forth the chains of cold. They're performing a ritual, preparing the way for a dark anchor. Open rift to oblivion. It's worse than we thought. The plain melt has begun. The portals reach from our side to theirs. That means there is a traitor. Perhaps it was simply arrogance. Perhaps it was all part of his grand scheme. You can know the logic of a daedric prince. Claims it fulfills a prophecy in those wretched scrolls of his. Imagine seeing your nemesis succeed where you failed. Let the way be opened. I am patient. Let the will of Prolog Fall be denied. This world will one day be mine. All right. So. If you're wondering what all that was about, we're going to find out throughout the main story what's going on. But in a few words, the main story of this game, which again is the main story of the three factions and not of the game overall, because after launch all the expansions add new main stories, but the starting main story we're going to be dealing with is about essentially, to put it in non-Elder Scrolls terms, I'm also just going to the Way Shrine to go straight to Dagger. Actually, let me go with the boat guy. Actually, do I have the Daggerfall Way Shrine by default? Looks like I do, so we can we can shrine sir. I think this is a newer thing. I, I don't remember this being here before, but we can just way shrine straight over. I'll explain everything later. But um, I'm just gonna hustle over there. Basically, uh, to put it in non Elder Scrolls terms, the devil is trying to merge the world with hell. We gotta stop him. That's like the the best non Elder Scrollsy way to explain. A more Elder Scrolls explanation is that the Daedric Prince. Um, Molag Ball is trying to do the plain mail between Tamriel and Cold Harbor. So that's technically more accurately what's happening. But the main thing you got to focus on is that there's essentially a demon invasion of the world. And we've got to try to stop that from happening anymore. So that's like... <laughs> if you don't know Elder Scrolls lore, that hopefully sums it up for you. It's basically berserk, as every good story basically is. A low hooded figure. Greetings. My benefactor wishes to speak to you about a matter that could affect the fate of our world. What does your benefactor... Actually, yeah, I guess canonically I am talking to her. 
So the canon of what my character is doing right now is a bit weird because I need to start the main story tutorial and questline through this bizarre approach, so whatever. What does your benefactor want? If my benefactor wished to discuss details in the open, why send a messenger? The matter is for your ears only. Where can I find them? My benefactor awaits you in the Patheri house, near Tradesman Square. Do not tarry. I'll seek them out. Alright, so just pretend we're not in Daggerfall right now, and there's not a million players everywhere. We're just gonna run over and do the opening tutorial, <laughs> kind of uh, awkwardly, so we're just gonna hustle over there. Um, I guess I could stop and do some, di some uh, what's the word? Deconstructing. Also, can I? I don't have a mount yet, do I? Yeah, I need level 5 to get riding skill, don't I? Pretty sure I do, at least. We'll hold off for now. I'm not going to start the Daggerfall questline. Don't talk to me yet, dog. Alright, let's just uh, really quickly do some... I just want to clear up my inventory, so let me just do this really quick. Don't mind me, I'm just going to do this. Uh, this is all non-canon behavior here. Don't deconstruct that. Alright. I'm not there. Get all the skill lines unlocked. Nothing to worry about here. I know what I'm doing. I've done this many times. Nothing to worry about. Just hustle through. We're gonna... What, in literally several, like, hours, we'll be back here doing this area uh, quest and whatnot. But for now, we're just kind of running through here and ignoring everything. Substantive. Um, Alright. Anything I can research here? Yep, training from that. Good. Deconstruct the rest. Good. Okay. Getting a bunch of achievements as I do this, by the way. Don't worry about that. I will tell you if there's something to be concerned about here. Get all of our stuff researching. I'm just trying to clear up inventory space before I go into the next tutorial. Alright. And then let's just go hop our way in here to the jewel crafting and enchanting building. Alright, I can't do any of that stuff right now. That's fine. But all this stuff is. This is the main thing I want to clear out here. Disenchant all the stuff I've been picking up. I'll sell this last one that has the ornate modifier. Although first, anything to disenchant? No. All right, so I think we can just sell straight to her. Anything can be made better through enchantment. Anything. Don't believe me? Give it a try. All right, sure. Okay, so we can sell. Um, so all that ash I collected—that's almost 600 gold right there for selling all this ash. That is a lot of gold uh, for the opening here, We are where we have only 86 gold at the minute. So that's why I've been collecting all this stuff so carefully. It's worth it uh, quite a bit to have this extra stuff. I'm going to sell the Traveler stuff here. Um, the bow, I need to deconstruct at the wood place, so I'm going to hold off on that. And then those recipes I'll go ahead and learn now, actually. Well, yeah, let me learn these now. Alright, now I didn't have provisioning before. Okay, I guess I have it now. That's fine. I guess I didn't have it because I didn't learn it, so that's fine. And then, how much gold do I have now? I think I can buy one bag upgrade while I'm here. May as well talk to Narissipa. This one has the bag for you. Narissipa has just the thing to carry your items in style and comfort. What are we looking at here? Okay, 400. I'll, this is going to scale up a lot, so I'm just going to buy 10 more slots right now. Up to 70, I believe. Let's see what it says after it loads. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so 5 of 70 is okay for now. I could... Let's see. I could throw this in my... Let me put that in the bank, actually. Yeah. Max over here. I'm not going to use the experience scrolls right now. Experience scrolls are great, but they're best saved for once you're over level 50 and leveling your champion points, which take a lot longer to level. And there's many more of them. So I'm going to save all my experience Welcome scrolls the for post level 50, you know, leveling there. So I'll just throw that in there. Okay, good. Actually, unmark it as junk because it's not junk when it's in there. We also have limited bank space, but as an ESO Plus member, I have double it, so I have 120 by default. We can buy more bank space for gold, so that's fine. I can also do some thievery and loot a bunch, of, a lot of gold from stealing. I'm gonna hold off on doing that for now because that will take too much time. And in heavy armor, <laughs> I got the hooded figure is feeding the chickens. What? I've never seen this before. I, I did not know that she actually came over here and fed the chickens. Like, what? Given given what we're about to find out about the hooded figure and her motives in just a second, this is very weird. Okay. That is 
Wow, alright, so... Alright, so let's just move on from that. Uh, that's not the right house. Let's go ahead and, surprise, I'm doing the um, the Cold Harbor tutorial in this video, too. If you thought that this, this video looked a bit long for where we were in finishing the first tutorial, I'm doing this one, too. I'm doing a two-for-one deal because this tutorial is a lot faster, and it honestly is kind of fun because it's much more combat-oriented. So first, we're going to steal all the stuff from this guy's house. Don't worry about whatever's going on on the bed there. We're going to worry about that in literally a few seconds. First, I want to just loot everything. Oh, that's what that's why you loot everything. I just found pumpkin cheesecake recipe in this chest. That's that's worth it. That's definitely worth it. I would have had to spend hundreds of gold on that otherwise. Alright, let's talk to the benefactor. Who surprise is a guy with a, a thing on his arms. Rope is what that's called. <laughs> what the Alright, a little cinematic here. Yeah, this cinematic goes hard, so watch this one closely, because this is crazy. What's about to happen to us here? Looks like someone's doing some necromancy. We don't like necromancy here in this playthrough. <laughs> We're all definitely anti necromancer in this playthrough. Don't check to see what class I'm playing. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so the, the base game tutorial opens with you being murdered by the main antagonist and having your soul stolen and given to Molag Ball, which is a crazy way to open the game. Like, talk about um, having your character have a, a personal reason to do the main quest. We've been soul trapped by the main villain, and now we're in Cold Harbor, which is the realm of Molag Ball. All right, so let's go go ahead and uh, get this going here. Whoa there, are you all right? The name's Lyris. I hope you've still got some fight left in you. You're going to need it. All right. So this is the tutorial from 2014. So it's going to be a bit less sophisticated than the one we just did. But it's a lot faster, in, in my opinion. I, I, I don't know if it's technically faster. I've played this one much more than the first one. I remember playing this in 2014, and they have updated it over the years, visually at least, but the core experience is pretty similar. This place is full of surprises. So we're just going to go through. This is the combat training, but we that doesn't happen because we did the first tutorial, so we just fight this guy who has weird glitchy health, and then he goes away. Um, and then I think there's another Keep guy that spawned. That's just more danger room. on the way. But we're just gonna go through here. That RNG on the maidens having loot them. That's okay. I shouldn't Keep complain moving. about not being able to loot stuff. That's an inviting <laughs> misfortune on myself. Don't stop now. Keep moving. More cops on the way. All right. So if you're wondering what's going on in here, we're gonna find out later. Um, <laughs> not good stuff is going on. In Long and short of it. Stuff here. One hit to kill him, one hit to kill this one, or I guess maybe a few hits to kill this one. Alright. Good, good, good. Let's get out of here, my friend. Prophet. Greetings, Resident. Like you, I am a prisoner in this place. You must rescue me, and I, in turn, must rescue you. Hold a moment. Come here. We need to talk. Wow, the height difference situation is a little crazy. I just realized. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. All right. Um, I mean, Lyris is definitely like muscle-bound GF material. So, all right. This is this is a situation that uh, Quintus is up for, and he means that in every regard. The prophet. He's a prisoner here too. It was very dangerous for him to speak to you, even for a moment. You must think you can help me. Help you do what? Break him out, of course. Believe me, I can use all the help I can get. That blind old man is the only person alive who can help us get back home. Tamriel's a long way from here. Where do we go from here? These tunnels will eventually take us to the Towers of Eyes. That's where we'll find the Sentinels. What are these Sentinels? Magical constructs created by Molag Ball to guide his vision in Cold Harbor. The Sentinels are connected. If we destroy one, the others will be blinded. With any luck, that will 
buy us the time we need to free the Prophet. How can we destroy it? I've no idea. Brute force? We'll find a way. We have to. Be ready for anything. I doubt Molag Ball left the Sentinels unguarded. I have so many questions. I'm sure you do. And I'll answer them as best I can. What is this place? Where am I? You're obviously not in Tamriel anymore. Think of the most miserable, depressing place you've ever been in your life. That's paradise compared to Cold Harbor. And to top it off, well, there's no easy way to say it. You're dead. Then how are we having this conversation? I don't know. Once we rescue the Prophet, he can tell you about the gods and the ways of Oblivion. I don't understand any of it myself. If I'm dead, who killed me? A man named Menomarco. His worm cult is doing some kind of ritual back in Tamriel. They sacrificed you and everyone in this prison to the Daedric Prince Molag Bal. After you died, whatever was left showed up here. They call you the Soul Shriven. What does that mean? It means you're a slave and you'll spend the rest of eternity here in Cold Harbor, working under the lash of the Daedra. Unless, of course, you come with me. Are you dead too? No, I wasn't sacrificed. The Prophet and I were brought here... conventionally, if that makes any sense. But we're prisoners here, same as you. Who is this Prophet? He's a strange one, no doubt about it. But he's the wisest man I've ever met. He sees things. Past, future. Oh, all right. We should keep moving. Okay. Um, oh yeah, we're fine. Also unlocked all the crafting skill lines. So crafting skill lines also, like other skill lines, go up to 50, and they, have, they all have a bunch of passive things you can unlock to make your crafting better. It's a big uh, skill point, sort of a... Uh, what's the word? It's a place to spend all your skill points. It's a big skill point um, sort of investment opportunity. That's not the right word, is it? What am I trying to say? Skill point dump? Maybe that's the right word. Dump your skill points in there. It's just some... A bit of magic. Ouch. Our puncture is already well played, ranked 4. We're gonna get you're that uh, fully upgraded soon. My plan, by the way, is to get the every... Mortality knows of your escape. Hurry. Let's get every skill up to mor morph ability, and then I'll switch away to uh, level up other skills. I'm planning to basically have... I haven't played this game like this normally, so this isn't part of this playthrough specifically, but I'm planning to have basically all of my skills be ranked up. And, and so for most of the leveling, as I'm ranking up my skills still, I'm not going to have a very optimal set of skills. It's going to be more about having a, a breadth of skills to rank them all up simultaneously, more than it is about having like the build set up. I want to have all of my skills at full ranking and being able to get morphed in order to then do my build from all the options that I can have. Does that make sense? So hopefully this will make more sense as we go. Again, this is not a gameplay focused playthrough more than story focused, but I will try to explain my gameplay actions as I take them. But for now we're just going to power through some of Amora and uh, get back to looting everyone's favorite part of this playthrough. But there's uh, less looting here, it's not as extreme as the other uh, tutorial. There's some fun combat to do along the way. A little bit of uh, reaching. A level 4, there we go. Alright, so let's go ahead and grab the iron legs. That is not great for us. The health. And go over and equip this. And this can actually just be destroyed, it's only zero. It's not only, it is zero, um, zero value. Now we've got ourselves those three points. Let me go ahead and uh, run somewhere safe so that I'm not attacked while I'm getting this set up here. No one spawns up here, so I can stand up here. Let's get our Necromancer abilities uh, purchased and slotted. So here's the plan. We're going to grab all three of these first ones so that um, the sort of uh, the, the skill line that all three of them are from will be leveling up as we use all three. Because at, So basically, here's how this works. As you gain experience... Any skills on your bar gain ranking progression, and they're sort of um, the skill line that they are a skill from also gains progression. So, for example, we're going to have soul magic. Actually, soul magic is the one example that doesn't do this because this is only progressed by the main quest. But here's a better example: one-handed and shield. We're getting progression in this not just from using one-handed and shield in combat but actually from having one-handed and shield as a skill line with a representative skill on the bar. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. 
So every time Puncture is getting progression in its ranking amount, we're also seeing One-Handed and Shield as the sort of origin skill line of Puncture also getting progression. So because of that, what I want to do is have all three of these starting abilities, Flame Skull, Death Scythe, and Render Flesh on my bar at the same time, and not have anything be staggered. So all three of these skill lines will sort of level up together, just for ease of planning, honestly. So let me grab all three, and then I'll talk about what these all actually do. Shouldn't be too complicated. So, um, with no other modifiers yet, and this will sound simple at first, but this is a game about a small set of abilities becoming much more complicated from different modifiers. Flame Skull is my ranged damage option through the Gravelord tree, and I should say, by the way, Gravelord is a damage-focused specialization. Bone Tyrant is tanking-focused, and then Living Death is healing-focused. But obviously, I'm going to be using all three of these in different ways for different builds. So, Flame Skull, 28 meter range. It costs a little under 3k Magicka, so it's a standard Magicka DPS ability. Instant cast. Um, the roll, the little uh, sword and torch tells you it's a damage ability. That's its main roll. Lob an explosive skull at an enemy, dealing uh, about 3.5k flame damage. Each third cast of the ability deals 50% more damage. So you uh, cast it, cast it again, then the third cast um, of those in that row has that damage boost. So that's how Flame Skull works. And we're going to see it in action in a minute here. And again, I don't need to use all three of these abilities the same amount. I need to have them on my bar for it to matter. So my use of the ability matters less than me having it on the bar. Death Scythe is a melee ranged ability and a cone around me, or a cone in front of me. Cost me a little over 3k Magicka, so it's a bit more expensive. Slice into your enemy's life force, dealing about 3k magic damage, also healing me for 3.5k, and also another 1.1k health for every additional enemy hit, up to 5. So the healing is going to scale off my max health, so as I raise my max health, this will become a stronger heal. This is like a melee heal, mainly a self, well, not just mainly, this is a melee self-heal, and uh, necromancer tanks are all about uh, self-healing using death scythe and other things, so... That's pretty good. Speaking of healing, we got Render Flesh. This is a pretty weird healing ability because Necromancers as healers have some pretty weird mechanics, but here's how this works. It is a it's one of these um, sort of radius areas, so 28 by 12 meters. Um, basically, uh, it costs a very expensive 4.3k Magicka. You notice the roll there, that's the healing icon. Sacrifice your own power to repair damage flesh, healing you or an ally in front of you for 6k hell. That's a big heal, but applying minor defile to yourself for 4 seconds, reducing your healing received and health recovery, which is your passive health regain just all the time by 8%. So basically a big heal that's expensive and it debuffs you so that you aren't healed um, as much for 4 seconds. Now noting by the way, healing you or an ally. So if I cast this and there's no ally in front of me, I just cast it on myself. But I also get that minor defile when I cast it, so it's less effective. So for self-healing, Death Scythe is better, but requires an enemy to hit. Render Flesh will be fine as a self-heal, but it's expensive, so I can't I can't spam this very efficiently in an emergency, but that's okay. Let's get back to it. So let's head over here. Some of you guys may respond, so let's uh, do some skull lobbing. There's one, there's two, and then the powerful third one. It's bigger as you can see. Death Scythe action, very cool. Come get some more. Now, you're gonna notice all three of these are gonna level up to level two at the same time, if I've done this correctly. There's one turn, and then the third one should pop up as well. Okay, there we go. Yep, all those went up to rank two. And then Soul Trap, which I had earlier. Than three. Oh my gosh, this guy just appeared. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm now blasting through these guys up nice and faster. If I was using uh, DPS-oriented weapon types, like again, two-handed or dual wield, that'd be even faster, but I'll be able to use those later on when it's better to have more damage, so that's fine. This feral soul shriven. These things will level up nice and quick, because again, I ignored them for the first couple levels as I couldn't get all three of them at the same time. So, first couple levels will be pretty free as we just fight our way through here. That one to fight. God of self -punishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I actually like that line from there a lot. It's a funny line. Someone needed this chest back here. Shoot! Oh, that's fine. Dang. 
bong. That is green, so I'm going to sell that, or realistically destroy that. Or, I mean, realistically deconstruct that. I'm going to destroy that, though, because it's only white. Okay. Down I go. Let us swing around now to the other side for more looting action. Not so nice. So again, at these early levels, basically anything I do will be fine for damage. Later on, I can start creating actual builds and rotations for maximizing my damage abilities, but for now it's not really that important um, at these low levels. Let's swing over here to look for more stray loot here and there. Right. That might have been a fair fight if there were three of you. Over here. Three skulls off. Some healing. It's all fine in a minute. Alright. Continue searching for any stray loot. Just the chance. Oh, here we go. This is why you check. Get these recipes. Uh, save myself a lot of money later on. You really genuinely cannot. I cannot overstate the value of getting these recipes for free for randomly finding them in. Containers and whatnot, it really just saved me so much money later on if I'm trying to find all the recipes, which I will want to eventually do, one way or another. Notice that her attacking me while I had my shield up set her off balance. That's one of the reasons why uh, blocking and timing your blocks well can be really great. You can definitely get good control of the battlefield like that. Alright, so let's this one right here. Get this person as well. Nice. This is the scythe just for style points, honestly. Alright, let's start from range. Close the distance. Alright. Already rank 4 <coughs> on these uh, class abilities. Great. Power through here. I kind of wish that I could use the scythe as an execute, so it would be really cool, but that is not how it seems. If only. Um, let's get this clan here just for the fun of it. Skull's off. If I use the skull at all, I should have made it all three times to reset it. Uh, this was... Oh, that's six. That's six, six values, so I may as well sell that. <clears throat> Try to be inconspicuous. Just got free of this place. Right, so this is your, your stealth tutorial, so let's just uh, throw a skull. Oh, I gotta do it in melee, don't I? I gotta wait probably for another cycle. Please let me through in time. Don't look at me, please. Ah, Alright. There we go. Stealth tutorialized. Stealth has been taught. I now know about stealth. Quickly, while he's blinded, we must get to the prophet. Alright, let's go rescue the prophet. So jump our way down. Alright, Prophet, here I come. Time to save you. Oh, Fool. guess not. You will never escape my realm. Hermamora's whacking tongue. The door's warded. We'll never get in this way. Damn it. Destroying the Sentinel must have triggered these wards. We'll need to find another way in. Maybe Cadwell can help us. Who's Cadwell? Cadwell is the oldest of the soul shriven. After years of torment, Soul Shriven usually go insane and turn feral. But not Cadwell. He was already insane before he left Tamriel. Mad as a box of frogs, but completely harmless. You'll see. How can a madman possibly help us? Cadwell sees things as he wishes them to be. To him, Cold Harbor is a wondrous place. It's his home. But he knows it like the back of his hand. He's usually down by the river. Let's go find him. All right. First things first, I think there might be something in here. More of that uh, display of bad uh, melee range achieving, that's fine. Alright, let's 
go talk to Cadwell. One fine day in the middle of the night, two dead kings got up to fight. Back to back, they faced each other, drew their bows, and stabbed themselves. Right, that's the, uh, that's the Cadwell situation. Let's first loot this area before we talk to him and progress. I think uh, there's a few things here and there. I think some of these crafting materials, by the way, is a great find, so it's also worth it to look for those. But with uh, looting like this, you just kind of have to check everywhere and see what you find. There's no way to know where things are without checking. All right, let's uh, navigate our way over to him and see what he has to say. Hello, what's this? Out for a stroll then? Lovely day for it. You must be Cadwell. Sir Cadwell, yes indeed, a pleasure. And fair Lyris, good to see you, my dear. How are you then? We're trying to get inside the Prophet's cell. The door is sealed. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, that is inconvenient, isn't it? Tell you what, I happen to know another way in. Much more of a scenic route. Rather a fun little jaunt, actually, full of traps and corpses and nasty beasties filling up the bits in between. How do we get through all of that? Rather cautiously, I expect. Watch your step, hold your nose, and do mind the traps. The like as not be a fair dose of running and skull bashing as well. Where's the entrance? Follow the river. You'll find the door to the Undercroft at the water's end. Once you're inside, stick to the light, and you'll find a ladder that will take you right up to the Prophet straight away. Do give him my best. Thanks. Best of luck. Do check in now and again, won't you? How do you know Lyris exactly? Ah, Lyris. Girls as mad as sheer Gorus and Jammies. Heart's in the right place, I suppose. Says she's got to rescue the Prophet to save us all from eternal torment. How an old blind man could do that is quite beyond me. What do you know about the Prophet? An imperial gentleman. Apparently he was once a powerful mage, but the years haven't been kind. Lyris says he knows of a path back to Tamriel. I rather think that if one existed, I'd have found it by now. You don't think there's a way to get home? I haven't actually given it much thought. Uh, anything's possible, I suppose. Truth is, I've been here so long, this place feels like home. But a good uprising now and again is a pleasant diversion, so where's the harm, eh? Tell me about yourself, Sir Cadwell. Well, there's not much to tell, is there? It's the same old pish-tosh, gallant knight, epic quests, rescued maidens. <laughs> I came to this land when my head was quite unceremoniously separated from my body. Bad luck, that, but uh, you make the best of things. How long have you been here? Oh, quite a long time. In fact, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if I was the oldest of the soul shriven, of those who didn't go fear all that is. I know every tunnel and path, every nook and cranny. The others look up to me, I suppose. Oh, interesting. Some guy wants to group with me. I'm going to decline that. Yeah, I don't know who that is. This undercroft is a delightful place. Probably means it's a death trap. Better be careful. Back to throwing skulls. Okay, keep going, please. All right. I'm just, I'm just fishing for rare drops here, but there's probably nothing too great. Yeah, these uh, zombies. Chest on something. Everyone knows about these chests now, so I can never find them closed anymore. Oh well. So this is the original game's lockpick tutorial, but Lyris is going to not have the correct dialogue, so she's going to... Yeah. Sooner we can get out of she's going to act as though you've, like, declined to lockpick it, she'll be mad at you. you got to open this door! Why aren't you opening the door? It's like, alright. I can't believe I also let a lock get destroyed on a trivial lock. That's not a great... Not a great little uh, showing there, but I was talking, so... Alright, on we go this area here with a lot of uh, dead bodies and rising skeletons. Not the kind that I'm raising, so that's uh, not going to work for me. Fortunately, these guys are pretty weak. And this sword here I can actually probably use as my new sword. Yes, indeed. Keep our eyes peeled for that sort of thing. And uh, let's see if we spot any other armor. I think there might be a shield we can find. Not here, I guess. Um, Players. Players with the blue names. That's generally going to tell you that it's a player under most circumstances. So, some of these traps are dangerous. Let's be careful. This person's just standing there awkwardly. I don't know what that's about. 
Let's uh, tra traverse through this dangerous area. Now, with all the players here, uh, these areas are pretty cleared out, so we can just kind of move through here nice and quick. Oh my gosh, that skeleton is uh, not shooting at me, but now he's already uh, killed by me. The scythe. All right. You know they're ugly when an axe in the face is an improvement. All right, there is. <laughs> um, I like all Vlerus's uh, little quips. Reminds me of me. Skeletal infighting. Interesting. Wait, you know what? That's probably actually an upgrade. Nope, it's not. But it is actually worth something. So we keep it. Any shields on the ground for me? That'd be cool. Doesn't seem like it, but I'm spotting any shields, which is a shame. Alright, alright. Uh, alright, there we go. Slide through here. Put it on the XP thing. Oh, that's just good too. Shucks. Little skeleton. Nice to see you. Wait, that guy didn't wait. Got burned. Certified heat recipient moment. All right. <laughs> Who let me record YouTube videos? They made a great the mistake. should be just ahead. Quickly now, we haven't much time. There he is. In this uh, rather alarming All right. room. The good news is we made it here in one piece, and the prophet looks unharmed. Now the bad news. It's going to be up to you to keep him safe and get him back to Tamriel. I'm not going with you. She's so tall. She also looks directly ahead of her and not down at me, which, if anything... Actually, is she... Do her eyes actually look down at me when... I guess when she's just standing there, they don't. That's, a uh, Yeah, wow. Wow, this is just the height difference of the century right here. Oh, Lyris. Oh, Lyris. All right. The only way for a prisoner to leave is for another living soul to take their place. I need to swap places with the Prophet. There's no other way? Believe me, I wish there was, but I don't see anyone else here with a beating heart, do you? If Molagbal isn't stopped, he'll destroy everyone and everything we've ever loved. So, keep in mind for the rest of the game that our character at this time is canonically dead. No beating heart, no working soul. And there are going to be a lot of quests that reference the idea that our character doesn't have a normal soul, leading to our character being able to get involved in the quest, and that's kind of like the way the, the story begins in those quests. So remember that, because this game's ability to consistently represent that our character is sort of not correctly in Tamriel once we return. Spoilers, we're going to go back to Tamriel. You can probably figure that one out <laughs> with the context clues, but... Our soul status is going to be a little convoluted, but the, st the game tries to set up something cool here that our character is sort of like had their soul stolen by a like, ball, sort of. We'll see how consistent this is. Once it's done, get moving. The Prophet will know where to go, but he'll need your eyes and your protection. Forgot to say, I'm ready when you are, but she just went for it. Love that in a woman. All right, um, let's see if uh, we can do the little ritual here. Protector, though. Guess there's going to be some intrusions here to stop her. Here we go. More uh, fountain. Here. Damn. Pistons activated. And then a little music cue is going to be very nice. Feeling. It will be fitting, though, if Molog Bal has his way. Thank the divines, you are safe. There is that, at least. Lyra sacrificed everything that we might go free. Her sacrifice must not be in vain. Can we find a way to take her with us? I wish that were possible, but I promise you, once we escape Cold Harbor, we will find a way to rescue her together, Vestige. Vestige? That is the name I have given you. You are but a trace of your former self, a soulless one, an empty vessel that longs to be filled. 
It is as the scrolls foretold, but not exactly as I imagined. Why does Lyrus call you the prophet? That is what I've come to be called. My true name is lost even to me. Years of torment have taken their toll. Quickly now, we must make haste to the anchor. Anchor? The anchors are Daedric machines of the darkest magic. Their chains bind our world and pull it towards Cold Harbor. I can use one of these anchors to return us to Tamriel, but you must lead me to it. All right, stay close then. Up the stairs quickly. We must get to the anchor mooring. All right, we'll come back for our definitely canonically 100% for sure confirmed future GF. Don't check the lore to verify that one. Let me have my fantasy. This is ESO. All of the lore is flexible anyways, so it can it can it can be so as long as I just don't look at UESP very closely and imagine what it might say about further second era lore after this game. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now these urns can actually have uh, rare motif books in them, so it's very worth checking these, because those motif books can be worth hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of gold. So you can save yourself a lot of money, or make yourself a lot of money, if you check all the Daedric urns in Daedric areas. Like, a hundred, like, really, for sure, don't ignore those ones. You can ignore all the, like, little sacks and whatnot that I'm looking there in. There it is! But the, the, the urns, you gotta check those. Alright, first things first, then. Problem. The mortal thinks it can defy me. Futile. Soon your world will be in my chains. Got ourselves a uh, bit of a boss fight here. Nothing to worry about, though. We got the prophet helping us out. I will protect you. I think I actually hit that correctly. That's fine, though. Hit that one correctly here, but that's fine as well. Power through. Again, this is a tutorial boss fight, so I've, if I lose on this fight, I'm gonna eat my computer. I don't know why that's a. That doesn't even seem like a, as, as bad of a threat as the first one, which is crazy to think about. But, anyways, fight, fight's over. How come in every boss fight I'm doing, I just have the most out of pocket commentary? Alright, whatever. Collar of Bones. That's a necromancer themed uh, thing, incidentally, which is kind of cool. This strand was taken from the neck of the Child of Bones. It's surprisingly cold. Go ahead and uh, throw this on to our neck. Level 5 and all of our things there. That's pretty good. Let's talk to the Prophet. The Dark Anchor's portal is high above us. I will prepare a spell to lift us to it. But first, you must reattune yourself to Nern in order to regain your physical form. To do this, you will need a Sky Shard. A Sky Shard? A shard of ethereal magicka that carries the essence of Nern. Some link them to Lorcan, the missing god of creation. If you collect and absorb its power, it should restore your corporeal form. I will summon one of these shards for you to absorb. I'm ready. Alright, so this is the uh, original tutorial telling you what sky shards are. I'm just gonna summon this. Shard of Aetherius, fall upon us now and anoint us with your blessing. There, quickly! Collect the sky shard. First, you'll never guess what happens next. It's time to loot. There are some urns hidden away, and I have gotten good motif books from these before. So unless Zenimax has changed it, which they probably have, because I haven't gotten motif books from these urns for years, but the chance of a motif book is so tempting. I told you. Crafting Motif 4 Nord style. This isn't a super rare one. This is only a couple hundred gold. But. I told you. What was I just saying? Alright, so we got ourselves a Motif book. That was also a superior ransacker for picking up a blue item from a, a container. That right there is enough for my unhealthy obsession with looting everything to be renewed for another few years. <laughs> Ooh, Zenimax, you made a bad decision. This, play this playlist is going to be... Looting with a very small amount of side ESO playing <laughs> as well. Sorry everybody, but I gotta do it. It's like it's like a it's like the, the algorithm for like a gambler where every so often you just get that little win to keep the addiction going. Except instead of gambling, I'm looking in chests. Wow. 
Incidentally, there's probably an inverse relationship between looking in chess in ESO and looking at chess IRL. <laughs> I suppose those things may be correlated in rare occasion, but probably not usually. <laughs> Anyways, uh, whatever whatever that's about, let's uh, take a look at the Sky Shard. This will actually count as a real Sky Shard for the Sky Shard mechanic, where every three Sky Shards you interact with, you get one skill point, and there's normally 16 Sky Shards per zone. Some of the smaller zones, I think, have sm uh, fewer Sky Shards as well. Um, but basically, Sky Shards help you get more skill points, because once you hit level 50, you stop gaining skill points from leveling. So the Sky Shards let you keep getting skill points from exploration, because they're scattered around all over the place. We're gonna do some more T posing, and this time we're gonna get one Sky Shard point from the Sky Shard and an achievement for the Wailing Prison Sky Shard. Great Akatosh, right. Dragon God of Time, I require your Ready? strength. Let the way be oh. opened. Time it perfectly. Let these wandering souls return home. Let the will of Moloch Val be denied. All right, so this Prophet character, we're gonna learn about more in the future, but we know for now, he has the power to talk to Akatosh and summon a portal from Cold Harbor to Tamriel through Akatosh, which is some very powerful magic. So let's keep an eye on this Prophet because he may not be entirely upfront with us right now about what exactly his power level really is. This is some extreme magical ability beyond again. what uh, most people Tell can pull me, off. We must speak. Also, he's a ghost now, so that's, uh, possibly bad? I guess we'll see what he says about that. As I feared, we arrived in different locations. I am in a city of industry where men speak of intrigues and plots beneath layers of innuendo and pleasantry. It matters not. You have awakened once again, and we must set you on your path. How long was I unconscious? Days, weeks, I cannot tell. The voids between worlds disrupted all sense of time and space. I know only that you were deposited into the sea, and some charitable soul fished you out and brought you to dry land. What should I do now? I'm afraid you will have to decide that for yourself. I must focus on searching for a way to repay Lyris's bold sacrifice. I cannot simply abandon her to the wrath of Murloc Ball. When will I see you again? I cannot foresee that, not yet. But we will meet again. There is still much we need to accomplish. So by the way, notice I already have the soul magic from the first tutorial. This is just here because this was the original tutorial, what we just did. And this is when you would have gotten soul magic in the original version of the game before High Isle, when the new tutorial was added in to sort of supersede this one. Be wary, Vestige. Our very plane of existence is in peril. The threat of Moloch Ball looms across all Tamriel, and chaos spreads in its shadow. Danger roams the land and will assume many forms. Do not let it catch you off guard. Where should I go? You must find your own path. But perhaps there is a reason for the place in which you find yourself. Explore and search for a cause to lend your hand. Join with others. You might even seek out those who rescued you from the sea. The choice is yours. You think there are many who need my help? Indeed. I sense that even now, there are good people near you who face grave danger. They need your assistance, should you be willing to give it. To thwart the will of Molag Bal, we must skirmish with evil wherever it rears its head. And there are others who would join me in this. We do not face these troubled times alone. Many shall rise up to fight this tide of darkness. Wherever you go, you will encounter others who share your courage and valor. Help them if you can, and enlist their aid if you have need of it. All right. Level five. So this is one of these special extra powerful level ups where we get two points and two skill points, so two attribute and two skill points, and health rings. And we also get access to the Imperial racial skill line. So let's continue leveling health for now. We now have three skill points available, and we can take a look at the Imperial Skill line. I'm going to talk about the Imperial Skills for a quick sec, because this one is all passives, as all the racial skill lines are. So we do start by default with Diplomat, so as I said earlier, increases your experience scan with one-handed and shield by 15%. I think that this is the main reason I'm going with one-handed shield and a health build at the start, 
just so I can take advantage of this early on when it's easier to just level stuff up. So I'll be able to get this to 50 and then move on to other types of uh, weapons. And then the other part of this is very cool. Increase your gold gain by 1%. This is the main reason I wanted to play as an Imperial from a gameplay point of view. This is just going to make things much easier because I don't really want to bog down this playthrough with a lot of gold farming, which for high level crafting or spending money on housing stuff, which I kind of want to do with this character, I don't want to subject you all to a lot of non-questing like episodes where I'm just doing gold farming or crafting. So this will help me avoid that, although I will inevitably have to take some episodes or maybe do it off camera. Let me know in the comments actually how much you want everything in this playthrough to be on camera. I think for some of you that maybe can't play this game or don't want to buy it or play or don't have the PC to play it, being able to watch me do a really thorough, complete playthrough of this game with everything involved, including the grinding stuff, could be interesting. So let me know what you think in the comments about that. But whatever the case, uh, we also get a health max, max health boost from Tough, a max stamina boost from Imperial Metal, and a cost of all abilities reduction from Red Diamond. This is in particular quite good. So this is a very well-rounded set of modifiers. In the in all the games, the Imperials are meant to be kind of a jack-of-all-trades race, so this definitely reflects that in this game as well. And uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait and spend my skill points in the next episode. I'm going to do a couple uh, purchases of different skills and whatnot in the next episode. But for now, let's wrap things up by going ahead and cracking open um, these things here. So this should give us, yeah, the heavy, the unfinished torment... Uh, uh, curious. This torture implemented, or rather, this torture implement was never completed. Without the spikes fastened to the inside, it serves as a functional curious. They forgot the most important part for a torture curious, which is the torture part. But all right, so we can go ahead and throw this. Uh, this is going to look a little goofy because it's a, a Khajiit armor. So just uh, <laughs> this is the new look. Yeah. Um, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll make this work later. And also, another thing I should mention as well is I will eventually do some um, outfit customization stuff, but for now, I want to actually try to survive the fashion disaster experience of not doing any transmogging or outfit management and having just the actual armor you're wearing be displayed on your character with no modification. So get ready for some real ugly outfits for the beginning of the game, as I don't really have enough colors unlocked from achievements, which is where you get a lot of the colors for your outfit system to make something good right away. So we're going to be dealing with this bit for now. This is the the cursed uh, undershirtless armor situation with the shoulder pads included. Yikes. All right. Um, we're going to deconstruct that. And then I have one more thing as well. I got the uh, health ring set. We can just uh, throw these on the left and right. Um, oh, where'd it go? Left and right ring at the broken soul. I like to put those in the right and left uh, in the right spots. With the two of them on, we get extra health, so that's quite handy. All right, looks good to me. And then I guess I could do the Nord style. I'm gonna actually save this for now because I want to actually take the time to read it, and I will just do this probably, probably later next episode when I get to crafting. We'll see when I get to crafting. But whatever the case, that's going to be it for this first episode of the Cascus playthrough. This has been a very long video for what will probably well. Let me rephrase that. This is not a long video by my recent standards. But for ESO, it requires such a different kind of energy to play compared to playing a strategy game. So I probably can't pull off super, super long videos that often. It's also Friday and I'm really tired because I just finished a week of, of work. So I wanted to go ahead and start this project or because I was really in the mood for it. But I am basically tapping out now. This has been a really fun video. And I don't know if the videos of this project will generally be about this length. Um, I'm hoping next episode I can do all of Stros Mackay I don't know if I want to commit to doing Stress Mackay and Betnek in one single video. That might have to be two different videos because these are now, because I'll show you where we are now. We're in Stress Mackay. This is where I was um, earlier when I finished the first tutorial. But this is Stress Mackay, the first of the two tutorial islands for the Daggerfall Covenant, right? I explained this all earlier. So basically, um, I think next episode will probably just be Stress Mackay because I also have some exploration and some other stuff to do along with the quests. So. Whatever the case, let me know in the comments what you think about this first video. This is a very new kind of project for me, so I'm very interested, especially with this video, to get feedback from everybody about what this was and what you liked about it, what you would recommend me trying out in the future. If you want me to use that add-on that makes all the maps impossible to see, I'm probably not going to actually go for that, even if people want it, because I don't like the uh, 
the zone maps being covered up and I've already done content now. So yeah, that, that one's actually just off the table, but whatever the case, let me know in the comments what you think about the Cascus playthrough. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all next time.